Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to case writing competition and conference of IMA's India Case Research Center. With the objective to develop a repository of India-centric cases, India Case Research Center presents the second in the series, the case writing competition and the conference. The three-day event will be addressed by national and international experts and speakers. And I'm happy to share that we have received extremely encouraging response from case writers across the country. We would like to thank all our partners who have supported the conference and made it possible for us to organize it at this large scale. All India Council for Technical Education to be the collaborator of the co competition and the conference, Case Center UK, European Foundation for Management Development, Asia Case Research Center, the University of Hong Kong. Our sincere thanks to Mr. Ajit Balakrishnan, founder and chairperson, rediff.com, to be our award sponsor. Mr. Balakrishnan, your support is an encouragement for us and is a highlighting recognition for all our participants. Ladies and gentlemen, the three-day celebration of India case, cases will be live streamed on IMA's YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn and Twitter channels. You are welcome to share your questions through chat by mentioning the name of the speakers it is addressed to. With this, we initiate the opening session of the conference. Let me invite the dignitaries on the digital dais, Dr. Rajendra Shivasta, Novitas Professor of Marketing Strategy and Innovation, Indian School of Business, Mr. Ajit Balakrishnan, founder and chairperson, Rediff.com, and Dr. Raj Agarwal, director, Center for Management Education, All India Management Association. I request Dr. Raj Agarwal to deliver his welcome address and set the context. Thank you, Somia. Mr. Ajit Balakrishnan, founding chairman, Rediff.com, Professor. Rajinder Swastha, Professor Marketing Strategy Innovation, Indian School of Business, distinguished speakers, case authors, ladies and gentlemen. It is really a privilege to have you with us on this second IMA case conference. Today, we are privileged to have Mr. Ajit Balakrishnan an outstanding business leader and a man of vision and substance with us. With us, he is having a lot of interest in case competition, and from very beginning, he is sponsoring this competition by his own money. So we are really welcome, Mr. Balakrishnan, in this case competition and conference of fine. We have Professor Raj Rajinder Srivastava with us an outstanding academician who has contributed in transforming Indian business school, a global business school, and also contributing a lot in quality of management education. And recently he was also awarded IMA's prestigious management, uh, management award, that is the Keval Noria Award. We are privileged to have with us in inaugural session, uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Professor Anil Sahasbudde, Chairman of AICT, also Professor Rajan Saxena, uh, ch Chairperson of Case Research Center, and uh, Professor Metri, uh, Chairman of our Academic Council. We do have support and we, we really welcome speakers from Case Center UK, SKU Business School, Asia Case Research Center, the EFMD, and then support given by, uh, by AICT, All India Council for Technical Education. IMA Case Research Center is established after having a lot of discussion, de uh, deliberations, and research uh, among, uh, among council members as well as other important persons. The purpose of setting up this India Case Research Center is primarily to focus on developing and publishing in industry-based India-focused research cases 
and by providing an opportunity to convert business challenges into business cases. So an effective interaction between academia and industry in a form of developing case research center that can take place. And in last four years, we have created a very good repository of management cases, which are India centric. And side by side, we are also having a pool of very effective case writers and editors. Our purpose is to make these uh, cases accessible to management teachers at the majority of management institute, B tier, C tier, universities, colleges, department, uh, which are engaged in management teaching. Likewise, we want to create a virtual co community of institutions and organizations who, uh, whosoever are interested in development of business and management cases. We are also connecting with the various B schools faculty members and this particular conference and competition is created for that purpose. So then we can connect to B schools, universities department, as well as a lot of, uh, lot of institutions and we too can take the support of industry. So then we can invite quality cases, as well as these cases can be pub published and uploaded on IMAS portal by which a lot of management institute can be benefited. And we are happy to say that we have re received somewhere around 75 to 80 cases, and we have selected 60 to 61 cases to be presented in this particular conference, which are going to be judged by the eminent jury drawn from various B schools. We have witnessed in last, specifically in last two years, the scenario of education, higher education is changing rapidly. Uh, there is a COVID, there is an online education, there is a new education policy, there is a dig digitization, there is an impact of Industrial Revolution 4.0. And all these, all these changes are making a very big impact as far as the teaching pedagogy in management schools are, cons are considered. Uh, there is a shift change in curriculum and then further new and new ideas in a new changing environment are, are created. The scenario, uh, scenario of industries, that too is also changing. Services industries, MSME sector, this is also becoming quite important. So it is very, very important for us that how we are going to create new kind of cases as well as the cases which are India focused, which are, which are taking into consideration all these changing requirements of not only of teaching community, but by through this case method, we can develop the right kind of managerial aptitude that is very much required in a form of skill and competency among management graduates. So, so, so the scenario is completely changing and I'm a, as, as, as a professional organization, as a body of management professional can play a very active role. So, so we hope that organizing conferences, seminar, as well as this workshop, training to faculty in large number, specifically in uh, uh, several B schools. Currently, we have 3,000 B schools. We can create a effective pedagogy and we can also discuss, decide that in what way this kind of pedagogy is changing and what are the changes which we need to be adopted in coming, coming days. So with this purpose and with this objective, I think that we have very, very learned speakers in this conference. Uh, and I hope that uh, this, uh, the, the, the deliberations, two days deliberations and further this valedictory session, three days, three, two and a half days deliberations are going to provide us a new meaning, new approach and going to generate, uh, generate new ideas by which we can further improve, uh, improve the quality of our case research center and we can include more and more B schools all over India. So with these words, once again, on behalf of IMA, uh, I would like to welcome all of you in this conference. And I hope that, uh, th that deliberations in this conference are going to be very, very successful. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Dr. Agarwal. It's a privilege to invite Dr. Rajendra Srivastava, Novitas Professor of Marketing Strategy and Innovation, Indian School of Business, to deliver his special address, please. Uh, thank you, Samia Ji, and thank you, Dr. Agarwal. I'm going to take uh, the time that is allocated to me to give you my own personal journey and why I think cases are extremely critical. If we go back to management education, in the mid 50s, there was something called the Carnegie Report, which said that there was too much emphasis on practice and not enough on science. So many of the universities, the management schools swung the other way, and they spent a lot of time on theory and on more mathematics than practice, if you will, when it came to management. In this backdrop, uh, yours truly, went through the BTEC program at IIT Kanpur. I did my you know, master's and then I did my MBA and PhD. And I went one by one with a lot of theory and very little practice. It was embarrassing for me as a 27 year old to start teaching MBAs who were older than me. And all I knew was theory and had no practice under my belt. I quickly learned that theory did not equate itself to practice. So for example, when I look at the role of marketing, the role of marketing is actually to make markets imperfect. What does that mean? We want to use marketing to generate structural barriers to competition. And a brand is proof, a strong brand is proof that you have created those structural barriers. So if you look at some of the leading brands today, they protect you from competition. That is really one of the major reasons. So in economics, you can pick up all kinds of pricing theory, learn price elasticity of demand, figure out that the market is elastic. And if the market is elastic, economic theory says that you ought to cut prices. But the moment you cut prices, you destroy margins. And what I learned from the practice people, from the practicing managers, that the last thing they wanted to do was to cut pricing. And so you have to balance the, the theory and, and practice issues. And along the way, I learned you know, quite a few things you know, actually from industry. And it's ironic that we academics get paid to learn from industry. Uh, some of the key things that I learned, one is in academia, we have a tendency to look at data from the past and we describe how markets are behaving. But as managers, very often people have to make a decision with a vision of the future. And many of these decisions are normative rather than descriptive, that this is what we need to do in order to cope with the challenges or in order to take advantage of opportunities that are coming. So while we look at the past and causal analysis, we really need to be looking at the future in terms of what needs to be done. And from one of my colleagues who wrote a book titled Learning from the Future, that's exactly what case studies are doing. We are trying to position where the company is, what is the context within which the decisions need to be made, and what is the vision of the future that is going to determine how one might go about making, uh, making decisions. So that's one thing I learned. The other thing that I also learned working with industry, is there's a time dimension to making decisions. And you don't have all the time that is necessary, nor all the data that is necessary for you to come up with an optimal decision, an optimal solution. You're not gonna get there. So the big uh, one issue that I've learned is, is it better to be approximately right or be precisely wrong? And what the case study, you know, method allows us to deal with is, multi is, is multiple issues where we make a decision or we learn how to make decisions that are approximately right. Because the, the precise decisions that we talk about, you know, in terms of uh, coming up with closed form solutions, we generally don't have the time to do that. Another thing that I've learned, uh, you know, in you know, using the case analysis and, and particularly dealing with real problems is this issue of what one of my mentors called the, uh, the type three error. 
Uh, type one error, as you all know, is concluding something is wrong when in fact it's right. That's in the tails of the bell curve. And the type two error is concluding something is right when in fact it's wrong. And type three error, I learned from my professor, Ian Mitroff, is solving the wrong problem. And so sometimes, you know, we need to be, uh, we need to understand the problem first, the opportunities first, before we start solving things. And that is exactly what, you know, what cases allow us to do. And I think a, a big issue is that we sometimes solve the wrong problem as opposed to tackling the, tackling the real issue. I'm going to read a list of things and I will then tell you when these, you know, when these descriptors really came into being. So this is when I was designing a program uh, for a major company and the list of issues that we were dealing with was shorter life cycles, global markets and competitors coming into the play, increasing rate of innovation, the need for teamwork execution and agility skills, uh, knowledge-driven networks and virtual firms, technology-enabled uh, cross-functional business you know, processes, and moving from product orientation to a customer and market orientation. This is a list of things that were necessary for program design. And this, this came in 1997. This is 25 years ago, precisely. And these are the things that we really have to deal with today. And the context, what I wanted to emphasize is the context within which you make decisions are absolutely critical. And that is what we need to deliver. So from the academic side, we like to talk about theory-driven practice, but really from the management side, we need to start looking at application-inspired theory. We need to bring theory and practice together, and that is going to be done by the context which is provided you know, in the cases. So we need, you need to understand the multiplicity of factors before you can make a proper decision. In that context, I'm really fond of what I call issue-based learning projects, where you let the context help you decide how you're going to make, uh, make decisions. And sometimes what happens is the context can actually be relatively old. So many of the things that I mentioned in 1997, that was my list of factors to take care of, you know, they exist today. In fact, some of my favorite cases that I use are also maybe 25 years or older. I still use today Microsoft 1995. Why? Because in 1995, the company figured out that you needed to worry about how to manage the ecosystem. It, you know, everybody's doing it now. Google is doing it. Apple is doing it. But Microsoft had started doing it in the early 90s. So there's a lot to be learned even from the old cases. The important thing is from the cases, we ought to be able to, uh, to, uh, to decipher what are the issues at stake. And it is for this reason, we need to start looking at the context. I'm really delighted that we're focusing on a case center, looking at India and, and Asia, the Indo-Pacific, if you want to look at it that way, because the context within which we need to make decisions is very, very different. You will not find too many cases in the Harvard selection that are looking at, for example, uh, agri-tech. And uh, I've started using live cases uh, in my executive MBA class. And we just used a case on a company that was combining agri-tech with fintech. And this is happening in India. A lot of things that are happening in India, for example, in fintech are not actually happening in the West yet. So we need to start looking at the context and our context is really uh, you know, doing business in growth markets. And uh, so, so it's very, very, very important that we have uh, set up a case center at, at AIMA. And so let me just uh, conclude by talking about uh, some of the key things that are, that are really important as we look at management education. One is that the rate of innovation is not going to slow down. And what that means is that theory and practice have to be brought together much more quickly 
The second is the economic center of gravity will move to growth markets. So we used to call them emerging markets. I don't think there's anything emerging about a country like India. We are now the fifth largest economy in dollar terms, and we're growing faster than, let's say, the UK is. So we need to be looking at, uh, at where the action is. And uh, fortunately, we are in the thick of it. And if you look at the fight between Uber and Ola is happening here, or the fight between Amazon and, um, uh, and, uh, and some of the leading retailers, the fight is actually, actually in India. So the, the context within which we're operating is important. But one of the most important things that I want to emphasize is really that most major situations where complexity is the, what we call wicked problems, are these are multidisciplinary situations. So what we learn in the marketing textbook or the finance textbook or the org behavior textbook, we have to bring all that thinking together in a multidisciplinary context. And the case studies provide the forum for doing it. So by all means, develop the theory in a discipline, but the practice is multidisciplinary. And this is uh, where we come in. So to conclude, there are some three or four guiding principles that I have used over my 40 plus years of an academic career. One is in order to balance theory and practice, we have to listen to the market. We have to learn from the market. That is where case studies come in. Secondly, when we're looking at case studies, we don't have a perfect solution. We are generally looking at what decisions have to be made for the future. And therefore, learning from the future is learning from the case studies. The third is, as I mentioned, and I'm emphasizing it again, context matters. We cannot just keep the, taking the context from the United States or Europe. We have the own context within which the decisions have to be made. And these are contexts not only for problems, but actually today for major opportunities. And the final uh, guiding principle for me, which again is enabled by case studies, is that impact matters. And one of the questions that I always ask my students is, are you working on a problem that is worth solving? So we can make problems simpler, but if we're looking at problems that are worth solving, they tend to be multi multidisciplinary, they tend to be complex and multifaceted. Again, thank you for the opportunity to speak to AIMA and, uh, and uh, good luck to everybody in the case competition. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shivastava. I'll request Dr. Raj Agarwal to take the session forward, please. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Srivastava, for your very nice um, address. Uh, in fact, uh, we have quite large number of faculty members. They have not written case, but they are willing to write the cases. So sir, uh, would you like to throw some light that how they can write India-centric cases by keeping in mind this changing environment which, which are happening specifically in last two and a half years? So to respond to that, one thing we have to do is I have a belief in ourselves. So one of the reasons I have started moving to life cases is uh, that it's not just the faculty, it's the students. You know, we have very smart students in the classroom also. And so this uh, company that I was mentioning that was combining agri-tech and fintech. Agri-tech was bringing in the agricultural technology, but it had to be financed and the farmers needed resources to be able to implement things. So this company is, uh, is only uh, seven years old. It's, a, it's in its seventh year. And uh, it has already touched the lives of 4 million people. And if these are the things that we have to write about. So I, I would encourage the faculty to, to scan what is going on within the environment uh, that we live in. And there's so much change taking place. You know, last year, we had 41 unicorns come out of India. And this year in January and February and first part of March, 
we already have 11 unicorns. Why can't we write about our unicorns? And you know, what is enabling them you know, to grow? So, so one is I would encourage everybody to look closer to home. There's plenty of opportunity, there are plenty of issues you know, to deal with. So let me guess, just kind of stop by saying that uh, uh, let's, let's look at what's working, but let us also look at what is not working. So we can't write only cases about success because one also learns from failing. And uh, so we have to learn about how to take risks. And if we take risks, we also need to learn how to get up. So I can tell you for every 10 or 20 cases that I see related to success stories, I don't see a single case, maybe I see one out of 20, will be looking at how to turn a company around. So, so we, we need to really balance things. So the problem of asking me a question is that you ask me one thing and I answer something else. <laughs> no, no, that's, that, that's really great. Yes, Swamiya. So there are so many questions so you can take. All right, so there is a question which says uh, why it is so difficult to write about the failures as a case. Well, the part of the problem is that in order to write a case, you need to be able to assimilate the data, get the information together. And unfortunately, when a company has failed and disappeared from the radar, it's, it's really hard to get that. And then the other thing is that people tend to uh, tend to talk about what this what they've done right, and they don't like to talk about, you know, how they did not do something right. Uh, but uh, in my opinion, there's a lot to be learned, uh, you know, from the failure. And uh, so I, th I think we've seen a lot of books on success stories. But one of my favorite, uh, you know, books was, you know, how do we learn from from losing? How do we learn from failures? So the, the problem basically is that uh, there's not enough information available on why people, why something failed, because the protagonists have sort of shied away from it. Uh, so another point of view, we will need your uh, uh, guidance on that. Uh, there's a participant who's mentioned that why uh, case writing and research is not being taken up very seriously in business schools. Um, I think it all comes down to governance. And what I mean for that is uh, that if we expect people to do X, we should not reward Y. If we want people to write cases, that should be included in the annual merit review. And many schools uh, do not have a proper system. Uh, in many schools, uh, the raises are across the board. Uh, particularly in uh, in schools uh, that are uh, you know government supported, if the if the annual raise pool is three percent, everybody gets three percent, and there's no incentive. I don't uh, you know mean to imply that there has to be an incentive all the time, uh, but you know we as a faculty are you know supposedly there's a higher calling for learning and teaching, but we all respond to. Uh, the, to you know, to incentives to do the right thing, whatever the right thing may be. But uh, I think if we're going to be successful, uh, you know, people who write cases, uh, let's say that are published in the Harvard series and so on, uh, you know, at their respective universities, uh, you know, they get compensated for doing that, and um, and even even Harvard charges companies for writing cases. So, in my opinion. We, uh, in addition to the learning aspect and the teaching aspect, the, you know, the benefits that we get from that, we really should have within the university system uh, some incentives for the faculty to write successful cases. Uh, it should be like publishing a book. You know, when you publish a book, you get royalties. Uh, when you publish cases, you should get royalties and you should you know, get promotions and salary increases. Uh, Maybe you, I've sir. touched the wrong subject. 
<laughs> I'm, I'm really a big believer in in uh, in rewarding people for doing the right thing. Absolutely right, sir. So there's a, a, a small question which says, what is the difference between research cases and research papers? And after this, we have uh, Dr. Bhima Rai Maitri, who's uh, very much present in the session and would like to also interact with you. So, so if you can just throw some light on this question, which is uh, the difference between research cases and research papers. Uh, research papers, uh... They tend to be driven by empirical data, which tends to therefore go to the past. Uh, they tend to describe uh, you know, uh, how decisions were made and how the market has reacted to those decisions. So they are generally trying to identify causal inference or implying causal inference that if you do X, Y is gonna happen, how likely is it gonna happen? So there are all kinds of statistical analyses and so on. And uh, but when we're looking at the cases, we are setting the context. We are setting some in some amount of information sharing. There is never enough information in a case study to make a perf you know a perfect decision. And uh, Dr. Agarwal, Dr. Maitri, and myself, we could be looking at the same data, and we could reach different conclusions in terms of what needs to be done. In fact, we are all prisoners of our own past. So I'm a marketing person and I tend to think of, when I run into a situation, I'm thinking generally of how do I solve the problem by increasing revenue? Somebody coming from the operation side is going to start looking at, oh, we're having problems related to cash flow. Why don't we control the expenses? And so different people by virtue of the training and by virtue of the inclination tend to react to the same data in very, very different ways. And uh, so, and in reality, it's, it's like management is not like physics. Uh, when we look at Newton, the apple will always fall down on your head. It will not go from your head upwards. Uh, but uh, what happens in management is uh, that the market changes. So what was a smart decision last year is no longer a smart decision this year. Why? Because the customer is educated, the competition has come up with a, with a way to take a crack at the competitive advantage that you had. So, so in management, the world keeps evolving around you. And there's therefore sometimes no best decision because the context has changed. I, I hope that that said it. For the cases, we're generally looking at understanding what we should do for the future based on perhaps an understanding of the past. Thank you, sir. Uh, there's another uh, question with me here, which say that at uh, ISB, you have developed a center for teaching and uh, learning. Uh, how do you see this benefit other faculty members? Well, uh, actually, um, I started doing this uh, when I was in Singapore. I set up a center for management practice. And when I came to ISB, I added the word uh, learning to it. So learning and management practice, so it became CLMP from CMP. And the reason is that uh, we need to, uh, you know, I, as, as faculty, we should be in a constant learning mode. And uh, in my opinion, um, we actually, I, in my career, I have been a big beneficiary of learning from industry. Uh, some of the most influential papers I've written I uh, have been written uh, because I was working on problems that were maybe asked in the class by executive MBA students. But then I went to the companies, whether it was Texas Instruments or Microsoft or Procter & Gamble, I would go to the company and from the managers, I would get insights that I do not get from a lit review. And uh, so what I would like to see happen in management education, not just for ISP, but globally, there's the you know we should invite people from industry to come and spend time in academia so that would be like executive in residence you know get, get people you know from industry to come and spend some time in the teaching environment and they can also learn while they're in the teaching environment simultaneously um i have tried to push this idea of corporate immersion 
which is faculty going and spending two weeks or two months with a company to learn what are the challenges that the company is facing and to actually learn in the corporate environment. And uh, so more of that needs to take place as we look at the future. Thank you so much for your input, sir. Uh, we have uh, uh, Dr. Bhimarai Maitri present in the session. Uh, uh, Maitri, sir, are you there? I request uh, IMA Control to make uh, Dr. Maitri a co-host so that we can have his views. Yeah, Dr. Maitri is very much here. Uh, Maitri sir, would you like to uh, add something and ask uh, uh, Dr. Shrivastava here? So you need to uh, unmute yourself, sir, Maitri sir. Hello, ma'am. Maitri sir is not here. He will join you soon, ma'am. Okay. Right. No problem. Meanwhile, will uh, Dr. Shivasta, one last question from yeah, our there side. Is a, there is a very good question, uh, uh, Somia, that uh, the, I think uh, by Professor Mukherjee, that uh, SME cases are very different and they are getting very different kind of reception. So, sir, any comment on this uh, particular <laughs> issue? MSME uh, no, so uh, really, this uh, when I was mentioning this uh, company, you know, which was combining fintech and agritech, it is an SME company. So we don't uh, we don't have to all uh, write cases about large companies. In fact, I am now working on another case, uh, which is again a life case, that is um, really talking about uh, combining agritech with fintech, but also to, to you know go to combining uh, media strategies to go to market. So, so, th so these are a lot of innovative ideas are coming from, uh, from uh, smaller companies. And, uh, and, uh, and we got to realize that uh, when we look at our SME sector, it is, it's, the, it's that sector that is really leading to, to the, a lot of growth that will occur in, the com in, in this country. So when I mentioned all the unicorns that are coming in, you know, a year ago they were all SMEs, right? <laughs> so now all of a sudden they're worth a billion dollars, but one or two years ago they were SMEs, and uh, so so we should spot them in advance. Thank, you. thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, so one very small but very direct question, which says that as a faculty, what is my uh, motivation to teach through cases and write cases myself? Well, uh, there are multiple. Uh, one is, uh, uh, frankly, when I mentioned that as a 27-year-old, I started teaching and my MBA students were older than me and they probably knew more about me. Uh, it is, uh, one is, uh, is basically your own value system. You know, you don't want to, I will use, I hate using this word stupid, but you don't want to look like you don't have any gyan in front of your students. <laughs> and so, so, so one is uh, pride, you know, pride and belief and being able to add value. The second uh, really is uh, that uh, um, if, uh, if one wants to learn, um, that I mean, working, uh, working with industry, working with SMEs, et cetera. This is how you learn. You don't learn by just sitting in the classroom and, and reading books and, and research papers. Even for my PhD students who are doing quote unquote academic research rather than let's say the case study kind of research, I just tell them that I don't want to see a literature review until they've told me what the problem is. Now, I'm a minority when it comes to that. Most faculty members, like the PhD students to do a lit review. But in my case, I said, you, you go and find out what the problem is. You, tell, you convince me that the problem is worth attacking. And then you can always do a lit review you know, subsequently. And um, 
So the and the final thing is uh, really, um, I think uh, the you get a certain amount of satisfaction when you finished anything, whether it is a research paper or you've written a book or you've written a case, and particularly uh, if the case is uh, is used globally, you you f- feel a sense of pride that the case is being used globally. I know one faculty member who produced a, a video case, and uh, that video case uh, has uh, has been viewed by over two million people. And uh, so you know you've touched uh, it's 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 one way of of uh, disseminating or sharing what you know. And uh, I certainly uh, take a, a lot of satisfaction uh, based on what my students know, not necessarily what I know. But uh, if your students do well, then you get a certain, at least I get a lot of satisfaction to see my students do well. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you very much for such a comprehensive answer. <laughs> There's one more thing I would like to add, and this is for people who are administrators, administrators in this audience, that um, over the last uh, 10 years especially, I've tried to uh, deal with faculty, you know, so you could be from a discipline, but then there's a domain of practice. So for example, my title at ISB is Professor of Marketing Strategy and Innovation. So my discipline is marketing, but my area of practice is innovation management. Similarly, somebody could be a professor of operations, but they they, they practice the operations insights in in the healthcare business. So I've tried to create a dual identities. One identity is to your discipline. The other identity is the vertical or the domain within which you practice your discipline. So that I think is very useful if, if we can implement it. Yes. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, our apologies uh, for the absence of Mr. Ajit Balakrishnan in the session. Uh, we just got to know that uh, he could not join due to sudden health reasons. So uh, we uh, look forward Indeed. to have him in coming two uh, days and uh, wish best for his uh, health. Uh, thank, thank you so you. much, uh, Dr. Rajendra Shivastav, uh, for addressing the opening session uh, and inspiring all of us with your words of wisdom, sir. And thank you, Dr. Raja Garwal, for moderating the session. So with this, we thank uh, Dr. Shivastava and Dr. Ragarwal and end the opening session of the conference. Thank you so much, Swami Ji. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Agarwal. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, just another minute's time and then we move on to the next session on Asian and Indian cases garnering global interest. The yeah, Matri Sahib is there, Somia. Matri Sahib already joined. Yeah, yeah Namaskar. Namaskar, Namaskar sir. Namaskar, sir. Hello, sir. So welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the first session of the conference. And the theme is Asian and Indian cases garnering global interest. The session moderator with us is Dr. Bhima Rai Maitri, Chairman, IMA Board of Studies and Director, in Institute of Management, Nagpur. The speakers of the session are Ms. Vicky Lester, Deputy Director, The Case Center, Professor Jeron Wen Denberg, Assistant Director, Asia Case Research Center, Lecturer, Management and Strategy, Hong Kong Business School. With this, I'll invite the session moderator, Dr. Maitri, to conduct the session, please. Very good afternoon. Respected Professor Raj, uh, I think uh, who is a gurus of guru in this hall, I must say, 
just uh, the earlier session Raj was there and my fellow panelist Miss Vicky Lester, Deputy Director, the case center and uh, Dr. Jaron Van Dengberg, Assistant Director, Asia Case Research Center, Hong Kong University Business School, Dr. Raj Agarwal, Anuja Pandey, Soumya, and all the distinguished participants of this very important the case competition and conference of All India Management Association. So I welcome all the participants and my fellow panelists. Just to begin with, the title is Asian and Indian Cases, Garnering Global Interest. Now, if you look at this particular topic, I think Raj is always known for creating something uniqueness for the every conference. I think this conference, this title, Asian and Indian Cases Garnering Global Interest. So today, if you look at the globally, the global restructuring is happening. Now, some of the countries like Europe, they are living in the history. And some of the countries in Africa, they are like a rising sun. And the nations like in Asia, particularly China, Singapore, Hong Kong, and even Indonesia, India, Thailand, Vietnam, if you look at all these countries, they are in the limelight in this 21st century. Because Asia is a happening place. Today it is a happening place. The fastest growing economy, if you look at that, the countries in Asia, China and India comes first. If you look at the most disciplined and governed Again, country, probably people look towards Singapore. And there are n number of such examples each and every, like from even Indonesia, Vietnam. So many countries in Asia, they are known for many of the best practices in, in, in governance, leadership in the corporate world. I'm not talking about the only, the, the government, but it is a governance and leadership of the corporate world. And today, it is a disruptive world. In this disruptive world, a speed has taken over the size of the organizations. Earlier days, size used to be important, but today, smaller fishes are eating the bigger fishes. So in such kind of circumstances, speed also has created some kind of magic in it. Because of the speed of disruption, a speed of change, then the moment you get into the new context, new business environment, which demands newer skills, which also demands new style of leadership and also new kind of digital design and which provides new digital offering. So this kind of world, the moment we try to develop the SOP and to try to get into you know, some kind of standardization. Before that, another disruption happens. So it means old is not dead, new is not born. Always we are in the transition stage in this digital disruptive world. So that is why somebody has very rightly said it is a fluid world. So in this kind of fluid world, everything is fluid. Leadership is fluid. The intellectual capital is a liquid workforce. The strategy is fluid, it is emergent, emergent strategy and context is fluid because it is very often it is changing every disruption bring the new, 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 newness in the context. So like that entire world is a fluid. So in this kind of fluid world, the corporate, the leaders are doing the business. 
and at the same time one side you are looking at the cop 26 climate change and mother earth is suffering from the huge uh, you know damage to the you know the planet and sustainability is another issue and and SDG, Sustainable Development Goal 17, given by the United Nations by 2030, we supposed to fulfill 100%. So these are all some of the social issues and challenges. Keeping all these things in mind, Asian and Indian cases on the current corporate world, if you look at the kind of businesses, the Asian corporate houses are doing, Indian corporate houses are doing and they are also not only doing in the respective country today, it is a global village and from any anywhere one can do any any kind of business, any part of the, any corner of the world and that is where the, the entire world is looking towards India and Asia. Somebody has estimated 2023 China is going to take over the economy of US. And at the same time, somebody has also predicted 2035, India is going to take over both economies, that is China and US. India is going to take a global leadership from China. And in this kind of juncture, 2035 is the landmark year for India because 2035, National new national education policy is to be implemented 100% 2020, 20, 2035. So that is why 2035 is going to play a very, very significant role. And Indian education institutions, Indian business schools, and all of you know that two thirds of the global business schools are in India. Now they are gearing up, they are changing. And IMA, All India Management Association, has come up with India Case Research Center and large number of cases are being developed with the various sectors of the uh, Indian companies and also in various areas, various functional areas and those cases to speak a lot about the innovation, the adaptation, the imagination, the way corporate worlds are functioning in this fluid world. That is basically the three year down the line, what products are going to disappear? Three year down the line, what new products are going to come? And three year down the line, what are the uh, changes happening in large scale in the corporate world? Those are also reflecting the way we are doing business. Look at the e-commerce. During the pandemic, e-commerce was very, very small business, but retail was the big one, but retail has come down single digit and e-commerce e has gone to 13%. Uh, retail has come down to less than 6%. So this kind of dynamics and changes, and even if you look at the energy sector, Solar is going to be larger than two-third and, and rest all energies are going to be less than one-third. So this kind of the turn around in the very sector, very uh, every sector is going to happen looking at the sustainable business. And sustainable business is going to be the mantra for the future to solve the social issues, to bring the equality, to look at the diversity and also to focus on the inclusiveness, DEI are going to play important role. ESG is going to be the mantra for everywhere, including the corporate world and business schools. So keeping all these things in mind, Asian and Indian cases, they are going to set an example, set a best practices and role model. And that is where garnering global interest, entire globe is now looking towards India, looking towards Asian uh, corporate world, at the same time, Asian business schools and Indian business schools, they are looking at that, how Indians and, and Asian uh, business schools are functioning. And that is where, in this context, this case panel discussion is going to play a very, very important role. And we are lucky to have two great personalities participating in this case competition, uh, the panel basically, Asian and Indian cases and I will begin, I request 
Vicky Lester, deputy director of the case center, uh, to 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 begin, uh, you know, her views on Asian and Indian cases garnering global interest. So you may take seven to eight minutes, uh, and you can put up your views, and then we will go to the uh, uh, Professor Jaron Van. And then we will we will we'll, we'll also discuss on some of the questions. We'll take up and even audience, you can take some questions. So, ma'am, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Dr. Metri. It's an absolute pleasure to join you all this afternoon. Uh -huh. Professor Raj, fellow speaker you're on, distinguished panelists and participants today. It's just a very pleasure to be here. Good afternoon to all of you. I would like to absolutely just build on how the scene has just been set there and the impact really that Asian and Indian cases are having globally. As mentioned, there's a lot of change going on, all accelerated even more so by the pandemic. And I'd just like to take you through a few slides. For those of you that may not be aware of what we do at the Case Centre, I'll just give you a very short snippet of our mission and activities. The benefits of case competitions, tying into what you're doing at your event this week. Indian and Asian cases submitted to the Case Centre, a summary of those, and then looking at the global adoption of these cases. Then looking at some trends with best-selling cases in 2021 from our view and award-winning cases and then just how to keep in touch with us and find out more. So starting with us, we are the Case Centre. It's um, the independent home of the case method, and we're dedicated to advancing the case method worldwide. And we are a not-for-profit organisation and registered charity. There's three main areas to our activities. One comes under distribution, one under professional development, and one under recognition. So we distributing cases written locally for use in both local and international classrooms, offering professional development opportunities for case writers, teachers and learners. And this is through our workshop program and also different resources on our website, which are freely available, different videos and other materials that you can download and view. We also have a scholarship program for new and faculty to teaching and writing case studies. So that's through all professional development side of things. And through the advocacy, we promote wider professional and career recognition of the impact made by case writers and teachers through advocacy and our case awards and competitions that are run annually. And advocacy on behalf of cases as instruments of change and engagement, exactly what Dr. Mitri was saying earlier on. So benefits of case competitions, as most of you will be aware of these, you know, excellent learning and problem solving experience. You get to develop skills involved in case writing, teaching and learning, exposure to industry, real problems and real challenges. And that's what it's all about. We all learn through these aspects. Promotes the development of high quality teaching cases. You get peer review and mentoring and also an opportunity to showcase expertise at business schools and universities. So looking at the Indian and Asian cases that are submitted to the case centre, they do come through two different channels. We have collections, so business schools where they actually have a case centre where they develop case studies. So they send in a collection of case studies each month and keeping that collection up to date. And we also have our online case submission process, which is for individual authors that may not have a case centre at their school and they can just submit individually through our um, online case submission through our website. So we have over 15,000 active products available that have been submitted by Indian and Asian schools. 31% of those have been published with us in the last five years. These are from 664 publishing institutions. And some of these will be, like I mentioned, with having a case center, and others will be an individual author at a business school that just wanted to submit their work for distribution globally. The average length of cases being submitted to us from these schools are 11 pages. And I've given here a breakdown of the subject categories they're submitted into. You can see at the top there, we've got strategy and general management at 40%, which of course many cases can fit into this category. And then we have marketing at 16% and HR at 10% there. 
So looking at the adoption of the Indian and Asian teaching cases, so this is looking at countries, schools and programmes in the last five years that have adopted cases. So these cases have been distributed to 121 countries and the top five countries we have adopting these cases are UK, USA, Germany, Spain and France. Very much global impact going on with the cases coming out of Indian and Asian schools, which is fabulous. We have 3,622 schools globally having adopted Indian and Asian case teaching cases. 59% are being used on postgraduate programmes, 26% on undergraduate programmes and 15% on executive education. A bit more with the adoption, this is on case length and subject categories. So we have 9% of the cases being adopted with five pages or fewer, 20% with five to 10 pages, and then 71% with 10 pages or more. And here are the top three subject categories representing 53% of the cases adopted. So the main categories we have are strategy and general management, marketing and finance, accounting and control. The best selling cases, we put this together at the beginning of this year. So this is based on sales and adoptions last calendar year. And this is global adoption of the cases that we have in our collection. And those that are in Indian and Asian schools represent 12% of the best selling cases in 2021. And you can see here some of the trends, some of the featured companies, and we have the featured industries as well, which you can see technology jumping right out at us there based on mainly probably the pandemic and everyone using a lot of technology last year to keep connected and food and retail, apparel and fashion, transportation, entertainment, the featured industries you'd probably expect to see. And there are award-winning cases for this year. So this is based on usage last year as well and our competitions. And here we had 21% of our winners are from Indian and Asian schools. So definitely the impact is happening worldwide, which is fabulous. And the reach that the cases have through the case center is definitely global. So you can hear some of the trends, the winning organizations, uh, the different schools and featured companies. And I'm happy to share these slides afterwards as well for everyone. And you can also find these infographics on our website. So this really gives you just a taster of some of the activity we're seeing with the adoption and impact the cases are having that are coming out of Indian and Asian schools and just really a way to keep in touch with us and what we're doing. We're on different social media platforms. We have our monthly newsletter connect with topical stories and features in that. And the best place really is our website where you can find or you can search for all of the content that we have available. And if you're an educator, you can register for free and view preview copies of the cases and teaching notes to make sure they're going to meet your teaching requirements. And also there's loads of resources on there, whether you're new or experienced in case writing or teaching. And any questions at all, you can reach us through our website as well or any time. All of our contact details are over our website. I'll leave it there for now, otherwise I could talk all afternoon. <laughs> I'll hand back to Dr. Mitri and have some questions perhaps after your own has given an update. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Vicky. Now, may I request uh, Professor Jaron Van Dangberg, the Assistant Director, Asia Case Research Center, HKU Business School. So please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Matri, and thank you, uh, uh, Aima, for inviting us today. Uh, it's a wonderful experience. First time, actually, I'm speaking to such a large Indian audience uh, through the Zoom. Uh, that's, I think, one of the benefits of the pandemic. Technology has also brought us many new experiences, uh, one of them being the experience and the ability to interact more easily with people from across the region and across the world. So I did not create, you know, such a nice um, slide deck uh, like my friend Fiki. Actually, Fiki and I have known each other for 
what is it now 12 15 years probably a long long time uh, so it's also a pleasure to to finally see her again uh, we haven't been able to meet in the flesh uh, too uh, because of this pandemic so let me uh, give you a little bit of background about you know uh, what what uh, the organization i represent so i actually represent the asia case research center which is one of you know the, i would say the, the original earlier case centers in greater china we were founded in 1997 and since 1998 we've been uh, distributing our full collection not only through our own website but also through the platforms of our harvard business school publishing and uh, the case center meaning we have a, you know a wide distribution of our cases uh, currently we are developing roughly you know 45 to 50 uh, case studies a year uh, mostly with our own faculty uh, but at times we also collaborate with certain faculty from india uh, to actually publish some of their case studies you know after uh, taking them through quite a rigorous uh, review process on our side if you're interested in learning more about that actually my colleague angela will be speaking about uh, this uh, in the session on saturday uh, same time as this i think it's uh, the editorial uh, case editing session uh, where she will actually be talking a little bit more about you know the editing process and how uh, you can uh, work with the asia case research center but let me also you know reflect on some of the things uh, that professor matri has brought up uh, when i you know started working in cases and i actually started uh, working in cases in i think 2005 it was around around that time uh, asian cases uh, did uh, there was some demand for Asian cases, but the type of Asian cases that you know uh, faculty were interested in were very different. The Asian cases that you saw at that time were Walmart in India, Walmart in China, McDonald's in China. It was at that time really about Western companies trying to enter the Asian market, and you know uh, the best practices of Western companies in those Asian markets. And that has really changed these past decade, I would say. What you see nowadays, it's, it's really about, you know, Asian companies doing business in Asia and in their countries of origin, but also expanding across the region and expanding across the world. It's really been a lot more about, you know, the best practices of these Asian organizations, how these Asian organizations are, you know, at the front of topics like, you know, digital transformation and, and being based in Hong Kong, actually a lot of our cases involve greater China and what we see, you know, I, when we write cases on, you know, the, 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 the big tech enterprises in China, you know, the Tencents, the Alibabas, um, the demand for those cases is is significant around the globe because these companies are actually running, you know, at the front of the curve uh, when it comes to, you know, digital transformation, the use of AI, the use of machine learning. Um, you know, similar on, on a topic like ESG, you know, we we uh, we've always written ESG cases uh, also naturally because Asia is part of, uh, you know, uh, the uh, the develop the developing world so there's uh, quite a few uh, ESG cases traditionally in Asia but now also we see a shift in terms of you know ESG within corporates um, and uh, you know we see quite a significant demand actually from uh, our North American clients for ESG cases on for example, you know, Indian and Chinese companies in the solar industry, uh, you know, uh, Singaporean companies that develop batteries for solar, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we're always uh, looking to develop more uh, of these cases uh, too. And then when it comes to diversity and inclusion, I think that was one of the other topics uh, Professor Metri mentioned. This is actually, I think, a, an area that is very, very popular in the US. But, you know, when I look at the cases that are written in the US, these cases don't fit the Asian markets. You know, as you all, you know, uh, know in the US, uh, there's a lot of news about Black Lives Matter, etc. This is not really a topic in Asia that will be taught in a typical Asian business school. So we are also looking at, you know, diversity and inclusion cases but much more from the asian cultural context you know what does diversity and inclusion mean in a confucian system you know what does it mean in the indian social setting right and and that those cases are very very relevant and they're very different and uh, 
the demand for those types of cases is very significant. Maybe not necessarily outside um, Asia, but within Asia, uh, that is definitely the case. Now, uh, in terms of you know uh, our sales and uh, looking at you know where the demand in cases come from. Now, when we started developing cases, almost all the demand for our cases came from the North American market. You know, the North American market being the market that you know the past kind of they used the case method for the longest period of time. They also were willing to spend the money necessary, right, to buy the cases uh, for all their uh, students. But we have seen a shift. And actually, uh, currently, uh, our Indian market is the second largest uh, after, you know, after North America, India is now the largest market uh, for our cases. So we see a, a huge demand, actually. Uh, for cases in India, um, you know, one of the benefits naturally being that uh, cases in Ind India always had very great management schools and they teach in English, uh, which makes it naturally uh, so that they can use cases from around the world. And when we see demand for Indian cases, that it's kind of a mix between those cases we write on Chinese companies that are really about, you know, digital transformation, about, you know, uh, technology-based cases. Uh, versus, you know, leadership and management cases uh, set in the Indian context. That is typically where we see uh, most of our demand um, in the Indian market. Uh, uh, in other parts of Asia, what we're seeing is, you know, demand for cases is not as high, but it's growing rapidly. If you, for example, look at the Chinese market, uh, we see a, quite a significant increase in demand uh, within the Chinese market. Um, the only the difficulty of entering the Chinese market and, and many other Asian markets, uh, you know, so for example, the Japanese market where they have been using cases for a fair long time is that you need to have your cases within the local language, right? So if you want to develop a case for the Chinese market, it needs to be in Chinese. If you want to develop a case for the Japanese market, it needs to be, you know, in, 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 in Japanese. Um, and I think uh, one of the other reasons for, for the for the growth of Asian case development and the growth of, you know, uh, demand for Asian cases is also the popularity, uh, especially when I look at it from the from the Chinese perspective. You know, the market that I'm closest to, of the development of basically business education. If we look before the pandemic, just looking at our own uh, University of Hong Kong U Business School, we had 600 TPG taught postgraduate students before the pandemic. This year, we accepted 2,200 TPG students. So we grew from 600 to 2,200 just over the time of the pandemic, uh, mostly students from mainland China, you know, by setting up uh, also uh, schools in, in Beijing and Shenzhen, we can serve those uh, students directly. And we see a tremendous demand actually in this uh, part of the world for uh, postgraduate education. And also that drives the demand for cases. Um, a lot of deans, and, and again, I'm going to the Chinese market. In, in the Chinese market, you know, if you go 10 years back, there were a fair few schools that actually had a case center. Now, most of the schools in China, uh, they have case centers. So why do they have case centers? Because the deans, you know, get questions from the students that do the thought postgraduate or the executive education there. And they say, well, you know, it's nice to read a case about it. U.S. car manufacturer, but what we we want to read about, you know, what our champions are doing, what our national champions are doing. We want to know what Tencent is doing, what Alibaba is doing, you know, uh, what uh, Bharti is doing, um, what Tata is doing. That is what we are interested in. So you also see uh, this huge push in terms of of the output of of cases uh, now quality is 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 kind of all over the place uh, currently so i think that is still an area where there's a lot of gains uh, to be made uh, within asia but you know i wouldn't be surprised if 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 10 years later we have to say meeting and i tell you that now the vast majority of cases are actually sold within within the Asian market purely because the, the, the number of students and the quality of cases uh, is, is so significant that 
it will drive the demand globally uh, for case studies. Um, uh, that was a few of my thoughts. Um, you know, let me also share uh, the link to to our case platform and and to our LinkedIn platform in the chat. So, you know, unlike Vicky, I don't have such a nice uh, PowerPoint, but you can still uh, sign up uh, and, and and follow us and and have a look at some of our materials. If you're an educator, you can actually always uh, you know register an account and, and download sample copies of all our cases uh, at, at no cost. So. Uh, that's it for me. I pass it back to you, uh, Professor Metric. So thank you, thank you very much, Professor Jaron Van. Uh, I, I I think uh, both the panelist, distinguished panel member, they give a very very interesting view. Uh, uh, looking one is uh, the, the looking at the this particular continent, Asian continent, and uh, to begin the first question. Let me ask uh, uh, to begin with Professor Jaron again, and I'll, 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 I'll go to Vicky later on. So Jaron, you talked about, you know, you said uh, this Western cases don't fit into Asian market. I think, uh, I, I, I think everybody will agree with that. And, uh, you know, just imposing something, you know, company is not known, you've never seen, you've never heard. You can't imagine if you don't know, it is not in the environmental package. And that is where, you know, for example, as you rightly said, Alibaba, people immediately connect in China. Tata, Birla, or Godrej immediately connect in India. So local companies, their great practices. So that, and that is one part. But, but uh, the another important aspect, well, this is one extremely important point you have brought out in this discussion. The another one is that there is a shift in, you know, a, a learning. Earlier we used to call teaching learning. Now it is a learning is a center place and teaching is comes uh, for learning. Learning is at the center place and teaching is for learning. So that is where learning and teaching instead of teaching and learning. So in this kind of context, uh, knowledge is now available in Google today and the skill life is now it is very short you know every disruption demands a newer skill skilling reskilling upskilling so it means business schools earlier they used to build the knowledge and skill but now skill is at the moment they graduate probably they have to be uh, leading the unknown roles in unborn companies and probably the skill what they learned that may not be applicable in that unborn uh, uh, you know role and in unborn company. So in this kind of environment, the development of mindset, capacity building is extremely important. Competency alone is not good enough. Knowledge alone is not good enough, good enough, but competency building is extremely important. That is the development of skill along with the development of skill, a development of mindset is extremely important. Now, what kind of focus one should be, you know, having in while writing the case and, uh, uh, you know, what are the focuses one should use so that a growth mindset we can inculcate in the minds of the, st the students, a graduate so that they can take up any kind of role in, 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 in coming near future because workplace and work are changing continuously. Disruption is happening. And that is where instead of using the old, outdated Harvard kind of cases, how to get into this newer way of learning and what kind of focus one should be giving in India and Asia while writing the case. And this is the interesting uh, for every faculty member uh, of this this particular continent. So your views on that. Uh, okay. So let me let me share some of my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you again, Professor Matri, for the for the very interesting question. I, I do agree that uh, the system is changing. Uh, you know, very rapidly. Where especially in Asia in the past, it was very much about lecturing, right? One way transfer of knowledge. Right now, it's a lot more about knowledge creation within the classroom. And that is why also I think the case method has become very popular, uh, especially also with the senior leadership of the universities that see the value in the case method, you know, you know not only in attracting, you know, those thought postgraduate and executive students, but also yeah. by really, really adding, adding value to the, to, to the total education that you 
receive at the institution, right? Mm -hmm. And when, you know, and the skills that I would say the case matter is specifically strong in developing is, you know, your creative thinking skills, your problem solving skills, but also communication skills, right? Things like, you know, working within teams, communicating your thoughts and ideas clearly to an audience in the form of case presentations, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I see, you know, especially uh, looking at our own university and again, looking at China, that we have this transformation where we're moving from, you know, lecturing was, was you know, the standard way that people used to teach within our university uh, to, you know, a much more mixed approach. I don't say we are Harvard. We don't have 100% cases. What happens a lot within our university is, let's say you have you know, uh, three hour of classes for a particular subject uh, a week, you you might have one hour of lecturing and two hours of, you know, a case discussion. So, um, and in the case discussion, the cases in Asia, where, where we see the demand for cases in Asia are also slightly different from the Harvard cases. You know, the Harvard cases are really forward looking, you know, you basically say, you know, you are uh, so-and-so, you know, you step into the shoes of a decision maker. For a Harvard case, you typically step into the shoes of the, you know, the CEO or the CFO, right? A position that the typical graduate student won't reach until 20 years later. Uh, and, and and you you identify, okay, this is an opportunity, this is a problem, and this is how you should solve it. And, you know, they have this very active, lively discussion in the class, why this, why that? Now, what I see a little bit different about Asian cases is that Asian cases, the class discussion tends to be more about, for, for a significant extent, tends to be more about what the company has done up to a particular point in time. So it is more descriptive. There's more best practices included in the case. So, you know, how has Alibaba achieved something? How has Tencent achieved something? How is this company using a blockchain to distribute vaccines, for example? And, uh, you know, the only maybe, you know, 20% of the discussion is really that forward looking, right? Okay, you have successfully built up this blockchain to distribute vaccines, you know, um, how can you expand this to a particular market, for example, or how can you, you know, upgrade this to a different type of product? But most of the class discussion will actually be about, you know, applying frameworks, concepts, theories to, you know, what the company has done in the past and, and these best, best practices. And I think also, and, and I'm speaking again from, from, the, from the Chinese context, um, in the Chinese Confucian context, it's still very much expected for a professor to transfer knowledge to the students. You know, you cannot just tell the students, this is a question, you know, you, 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 you discuss it and you learn from that. You really are expected to transfer knowledge. So in that sense, I think, you know, our, our cases are uh, somewhat different from uh, the, the, I would say the, the standard North American, the, the Ivy and the Harvard cases, which are really, you know, all about this this forward-looking question uh, i hope this answered you know some of you uh, yeah uh, thank you thank you very much uh, professor jaron now my question to miss vicky lester you 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 brought out very important thing you know the average length of the case 11 page and some of them are five to ten page you know and all of you know that reading habits have gone reading the book, reading the cases and 28, 32 page Harvard cases, nobody reads. And now the time has come, the cases may come in the form of videos. Cases may come audio visual cases. And there may be a future belongs to two kinds of cases. One is a caselet, two to three page. Another one may be a briefcase that is six to eight page. And that is what going to be there. And people may while walking, while going, they may, they may, you know, with audio usual, they can read the case, you know, instead of reading, they can listen the case. So this is what and, and, and probably while case writing, what we are adopted, outdated system of, uh, you know, we just blindly followed Harvard many, many years. And even we people also publish in those journals and uh, uh, the Harvard cases. Uh, looking at the brand, but now the time has come, we have to publish our own because you know that all over the world, CEOs are going from Asia. India and Asia, they are leading the companies and they are learned in our schools. And what is that kind of leadership, management and technology, how they think, how they make a sense, 
for future so for that purpose today if we look at uh, uh, you know this kind of changes happening and, uh, and and apart from that you know there is another you know uh, 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 the perspective coming out in nowadays in the business schools you see today whatever the examination we conduct they are not capturing what we are testing the the outcome of mba for example you can't test the tenacity of the students courage risk taking capability and confidence all those things you can't test whatever the you know pedagogy use but even in examination you can't test but you know today one perspective is coming out very very clearly the simulations the business games if you play a 10 rounds of games with two parties then you will automatically you can not only they will learn they will also you can also professor also can test their tenacity courage confidence and all those things can be tested which is not tested in the existing or whatever the current examination system evaluation system so that is where how do you say about you know the cases versus business games how one should be achieving the balance and how case can also be used to test the tenacity, courage, confidence and risk taking capability. What kind of pedagogy we will be teaching so that we can get the, the kind of benefit people get from the simulations and business games that also come from the cases. And probably our all uh, India Case Research Center of IMA and Hong Kong as well as your case center, we should be all focusing on this area because that is need of an hour for our countries because we are in the growth path. So, so your, your views on this. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, I'll try and fit all those views <laughs> in for you. So starting with looking at the length of cases, I suppose, we we have seen a dramatic shift to shorter cases for exactly the reason that you mentioned. It's the time students have to read those lengthy cases before then going in the classroom so that they're ready for that class discussion. So definitely the adoption of cases is more on the side of the shorter cases so that even if the, the case hasn't been read before the case before the case class then it can be digested and read just at the very beginning of the class so they can dive into that conversation and the thing we've always said about cases is that one they're very versatile and they're not the only teaching tool to use in the classroom you know, we always say it's one of the ways in which you can engage your students in the class. So you can use your case studies along with simulations, with business games, with your lectures. There's a whole mix, including the videos. We have a lot of demand um, or questions being asked about multimedia cases. But at the end of the day, it can be some text and a YouTube video and you have a multimedia case it's basically adding those different elements into the classroom so you have a bit of video to engage the students with a bit of text which could be also recorded in audio form like you say they could be just listening to that on their way to class rather than reading but it's the it's the mixture of content that really helps bring the learning to life in the classroom and case studies are still a brilliant way to do that and because they're so versatile they can be used on different platforms very easily different teaching platforms, online, in the room. At the end of the day, they're there to engage the students and really to de develop what we've all been saying, all those softer skills that employers are looking for when they're recruiting. We, we love the fact that we're independent and impartial because as Jerome was mentioning, there's so many different ways to write a case study and different views from different places around the world. And the great thing is, faculty can search to find the right case for them making sure it matches what they want the learning outcomes to be in their classroom. so the short cases can achieve that the the key to it is really thinking about right what's the teaching note perhaps starting with the teaching note what is it that we want to achieve with this case study then that really helps the author of the case just keeping the essential ingredients in the case that are relevant to that particular learning objective and that's where you can get now more easily the shorter cases you don't have to read a 20 page case if there's just a particular one learning objective you want to achieve with your students so this is where more faculty now are looking for those shorter cases reviewing the teaching notes perhaps initially saying this is exactly what i want to focus on 
and this short case gives me that and also at undergraduate level more so where they don't have the time um, or, or desire to read the cases before coming in the class so you want those shorter cases that are really going to be bite-sized learning that can be built on over all of the classes and the courses that they have and I think this is a lot of what's happening with the future of education is that there's going to be lots of modular courses that students just want to build on as they develop their career they'll go into start their, their work add on another little block and just keep going rather than you know two three years one course it will be right I'll learn this first go in the working world then come back to school to do add-on bite-sized courses and that's where you know cases bring that learning bring that experience and really make it relatable for the students that's the key at the end of the day as we were saying you know not everyone's going to go straight into a ceo position you need to make sure it's local for local students can they relate to it can they see themselves in the shoes of that protagonist so lots of things to be thinking about when the cases are being developed and really knowing the audience as well like with anything who who are the learners going to be what is it that we want to teach them what are they going to relate to and then finding the relevant content to engage them in the classroom so yeah thank you thank you very much miss vicky i think we have a very very wonderful session on asian and indian cases garnering global interest i think a lot of innovative way of developing cases and also focus on on case writing and also number of pages length of case and apart from that now the time has come uh, the local vocal and global which our indian prime minister you know said uh, very recently few months back i think now the time has come as professor jaron rightly mentioned you know indian companies and asian companies and you know all our respective nations people can uh, you know connect themselves while learning and the best practices are happening because this is a happening place this is a marketplace asia and india is a marketplace and that is where writing cases on that and the attempt has been made all india management association i think uh, 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 dr anuja uh, is working on that developing the cases uh, indian cases uh, india case research center and communicating to all the business schools i think now the time has come probably uh, vicky and jaron both of you should think all the case associations in asian countries we should have our own association so that we can together build a stronger case than the west now the time has come the sun is you know looking towards east and we should be a stronger and coming together as a network probably we can begin with these three cases as a association and we can expand so that asian case as a one single umbrella we can take it to the globe so local to vocal now the time has come west should adopt what is happening in the east so with this thank you very much for your insights valuable innovative way of developing cases and a very nice presentation uh, 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 professor vicky and jaron thank you very much thanks and thanks for aima for uh, you know organizing this panel under the banner of case competition and a conference thank you very much thanks Namaste. thank you very much thank you it's been a pleasure thank you dr maitri Ms. Lester, Professor Denberg, thank you, distinguished panel, for joining and sharing your thoughts. Ladies and gentlemen, we are starting with the inaugural session of Case Writing Competition and Conference by IMERS India Case Research Center. It is my privilege to invite our guest of honor, Dr. Anil D. Sahasrabuddhi, Chairman AICTE. Dr. Rajan Saxena, Chairman, IMA India Case Research Center, former Vice Chancellor, SVKMS, NMIMS University, Mumbai, and Dr. Raj Agrawal, Director, Center for Management Education, IMA. May I now invite 
Dr. Rajan Saxena to introduce the guest of honor, please. Thank you very much uh, for giving me this, uh, if I were to say this, and a privilege, and I feel privileged to be introducing uh, a very dear friend and an and, and education leader, I would say the leader in higher education, uh, Dr. Anil Sesrabhudev. Dr. Anil Sesrabhudev is uh, the currently, as many of us in India know him, is the chairman of the All India Council for Technical Education, which oversees the entire technical education in this country. Since his joining as the chair of the AICTE, Dr. Sreshra Budde has brought about a significant reforms in AICTE's functioning. One of the biggest kind of a challenge that all of us in management education have had is the fact that all along the regulators have assessed the management schools essentially on the basis of the inputs rather than the outcomes itself. And here is where Dr. Sesha Budde made a very big difference of saying that, well, it is necessary for us to look at not just merely the inputs, but also to look at it from the point of view of the outcomes. A very important part was in terms of this, of also saying that there, it's not that every institution is at the same level of evolution itself. And therefore, there is a need to, to, to have a differentiated approach when it comes to uh, regulating the management education or technical education in this country itself. And many, many other kind of reforms that he has been able to bring about. A stickler for rigor, a stickler for quality, that's what defines Dr. Sesra Budde and his entire career. Dr. Setsu Budde was uh, a lecturer before he came to these at, 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 the, at IIT Guwahati, and after which he came over to the College of Engineering Pune as its director. It is that stint that we all remember him also for, the kind of change that he brought about, the transformation of the College of Engineering at Pune is indeed one that deserves a case, right? Case being written by management academics when it comes to, let us say, the issue of transformation or when it comes to the question of leadership, when it comes to the question of faculty development or when it comes to the industry institute partnership. I mean, name it. And that's what Dr. Sachabudde would have done it at the College of Engineering at Pune itself. So Dr. Sesra Budde, it's a privilege to have you once again with us in, in IMAS on the IMA platform at the, at the India Case Research Center. Uh, we are indeed thankful to you and AICTE for supporting this major event of IMA India Case Research Center. Ladies and gentlemen, many of you may know that India Case Research Center was established almost about five years ago, primarily with a view to, to develop or, or encourage Indian faculty to develop fact, good quality cases which are comparable to the world's best cases itself. And more importantly, it was also for the purposes of projecting India in the global market itself. And why India? Because we feel that, a large, that, that India is going through a very, very significant transformation uh, since almost 1991 itself, and more specifically in the last about uh, 10 years or so that we have seen, the challenges that we have today in this country and the transformation that is taking place in the Indian corporate need to be studied much more closely than what it is by the Indian Management Academy so far. Not only Indian Management Academics, but even by the foreign academics itself. There have been some cases, some some bit of write-ups about Indian Indian corporates uh, in 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 Harvard or in in many other foreign universities and in their articles and also in their cases. But I think there is a lot more to be done, and that can be done by the the Indian management 
educators itself. And that is the purpose by which we have really set up the goal of the India Case Research Center. I'm pretty confident that the second case competition that we are having today with part, in partnership with the uh, Hong Kong universities, uh, the Asia Case Research Center, the Hong Kong HKU Business School, EFMD, the Case Center, uh, MDSA, and AICTE is really going to yield to us some very good cases, particularly on the transformation that is happening in this country itself. And that is really going to help us to educate our students in a much better manner. Let, let me, before I just conclude, I just want to mention that experiential pedagogy, as we all know, is the best form of creating an appropriate learning culture in an institution. You cannot today uh, educate, you cannot uh, have uh, let's say, uh, just merely by lecturing, you cannot really communicate or you just cannot really create that kind of a learning environment itself. Because we are all aware of the kind of limitations of the, of the, of, of, uh, in terms of the human mind's attention to the stimulus that we feel across. So it is the experiential pedagogy that we have all been familiar with in management education. Uh, that has today been the, the, the cornerstone or the pillar in management education. And, uh, and that's why we have been, the management education has been much more sought after than many other forms of technical education itself. But I think having said that, there is a need to also now think in terms of using a lot of technologies, not just mainly the print technology itself, that is developing 35 pages cases written and then going ahead and then getting it done uh, for, uh, for, for, for the, to, to the students. Today, the need to, to, to look at technology, today the need to, to bring in a lot of uh, data which the students can then work around, around and simulate the various situations and then create the alternative scenarios and then based on that, take the decision itself. So ladies and gentlemen, there are many, many challenges, I, but I'm pretty confident that uh, the case competition is going to yield to us some very, very interesting cases itself. Dr. Sesabudev, we have already published 50 cases so far, and there are many more on in the pipeline. Thank you very much, Dr. Sesabudev. Let me invite you, sir, to, to you. To, let me invite you now to, to give us your address, to give us your, your words of wisdom. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rajan Saxena ji and uh, Dr. Raj Agarwal and eminent uh, educationists who have been on this platform. Uh, prior to this session also, there was a meeting going on. I was just listening to some of the very interesting things about how case studies are created and all that. And first of all, I compliment ICRC for creating this idea of writing case studies for India as well as the competition and conference wherein they will showcase the case studies that are being created and giving prize money to winners. I think compliments to you. And we are right now into this mode of uh, this year's prize money. Who will get it to be announced and then they will get it. But most importantly, the very idea that we must have a indigenous case study writing competition and conference itself is valuable. And I compliment, congratulate all of you. Uh, stepping back, you have been trying to talk about how transformation is happening in AICT, but more importantly, very recently, the new national education policy which has come in, and you are referring to that, about how the learning has to happen or can happen in terms of not just the theory classes in the classrooms, but the experiential learning, going outside and doing it is very, very valuable and important, and that's why internship has been given extremely more importance in the new policy and we have been advocating that like in medical education or in the law why can't we have internships in all variety of education be it in arts commerce science or may, maybe in engineering all the domains of knowledge they require a connect with the society and that's where 
we need to have internships and to create those internships naturally even in the classrooms we need to have some kind of an environment where you have to bring in practical experience into the classrooms and that is where in the management education for quite some time we have been talking about case studies and that's how harvard business school case reviews will keep coming in the aima has started this whole process you said just now 50 case studies are published maybe we need hundreds and hundreds of case studies a country with 1.4 billion population 28 states six union territories i think we can have thousands of case studies and each one of them starting from at the local level some importance is there for some case studies to some of them at the state level some of them at national level and some of them even at the global level and that's why when we are talking about case studies there must be all four levels of uh, case studies local level may be relevant to only that village or surrounding district and some of them for a particular region because you have a particular language the nature of culture the the climate that all will depend on what is the requirement of that region and therefore regional case studies also will become important and some of them either for the national economy national defense for the national purposes in terms of industrial environment whether it is industry 4.0 or whatever and therefore at national level something else also becomes important and then beyond we all talk about today internationalization whether it is in terms of job in terms of uh, the entrepreneurial uh, nature of uh, the activities that are happening uh, dependence of one nation on the other although we all talk also of atmanirbhar bharat or individual nations to be self sufficient in whatever they may be able to do our dependence on others will continue to be there and therefore how there can be even international case studies so i am dividing the case studies into four different types of case studies possibly but if you look at uh, the national level you know we are all talking about aima and therefore our whole emphasis must be obviously on the the entire nation and i just immediately get reflections on some of the case studies which have come up in the last uh, decade or two in terms of variety of uh, new innovations which happened and they became the case studies one so one of them is quite old of course i'll referring to that as well because uh, when ck prahlad used to say about that bottom of the pyramid i think some of the case studies may be relevant for only top of the pyramid middle of the pyramid but something which is important for the bottom of the pyramid will get lot of traction both in terms of the popularity in terms of utility in terms of reach and also in terms of economic development maybe margins are less but those kind of things will really have a broad bandwidth and that's why bottom of pyramid type of whatever innovations and case studies become very very relevant and important so going back in uh, maybe several decades ago when uh, mumbai dabba walas created that whole thing where a person who is going for a job from a distant place to the office and then returns back the food which is carrying in the morning early morning maybe at 5 o'clock will be dead cold by the time he is going to eat it at the mid afternoon and therefore making the food available at the doorsteps in into the office was a great idea and perfected by people who don't even have education by just mere color coding and this has become really a very hit case study referred to everywhere and that is what is the most significant thing coming to the other uh, little bit high end products for example a car which is affordable by anyone we all remember that uh, a car within a cost of 100000 rupees was not easy uh, most of the cars are very expensive and when uh, tata decided tata motors to have a nano uh, people were saying sounding very very reluctant to accept that a car can come within 100000 rupees uh, which is so cheap but they did lot of research lot of r and d of course subsequently cost went up because the inflation is there but the whole idea of doing it within a value which is of a, one of the a big uh, you know motorcycles which is expensive motorcycle probably is more expensive than a car so this is a great idea and this whole development itself became a solid case study 
we had a story of hmt we have a story of uh, nascom uh, it giant that india is is because of the way it was done by the nascom itself is a case study you talked about our transformation of college of engineering pune it is done by observer research foundation and now the transformation happening in aict was also done by dr pritham singh so these are all possibly whether it is in education sector or whether it is in the case of agriculture sector our whole uh, uh, swaminathan's idea of uh, uh, agri revolution in india green revolution or white revolution by kurian these are all classic case studies which have been there in india for a quite some time and we all study them in our colleges and schools i'm not focusing on only management education because management education is often for a long time discussing these things in the classrooms but come to other domains of knowledge you know although we are all mostly management people here we need to create an atmosphere in the country that case study system of education should become popular even from the school side in the new national education policy when we are talking about the education to be uh, done with pleasure with happiness without stress and that's why in the early period of education number one how it can be delivered in the mother tongue on one side and through the stories games toys i, I think this is very very significant the toys the games how education can become very interesting a child will always feel like going to the school rather than distasting it and the subjects like mathematics some of the times the children don't like it how can it be made interesting and children should start learning mathematics some students don't like history how it can be made interesting that every student will like history i think these are all possible areas where we require education and this education through the case studies if the success stories are told in terms of how in a particular case this has been done and therefore it can be replicated naturally such kind of case studies will become useful right from school time high school science education arts education commerce or engineering education where it has gradually getting seeped in but i want that entire education sector should get it and therefore when these case studies 50 of them are there when some of them are increased in numbers let us have some attention on the general education also to be given in terms of case study mode and this is a very powerful mode because students are listening to rapt attention it is something like a story so whenever you tell a story many people get attracted towards uh, that particular feature rather than telling the theory behind that or deriving some equations people get bored but when you tell it in the form of a story we get all excited even the life story of an individual people will all, all appreciate and that's why in the form of story a case can be written and then presented to people now coming to the recent 7 uh, 8 years of the transformation that is happening in the government in the term, in form of governance we are often talking about uh, uh, what we say good governance models you know less government more governance you know so i i think that is where how some of the features which have come in in our daily life they are touching the lives of the people and can we create case studies out of them now for example uh, the scholarships which were earlier given through maybe sent to the college or university through a check and then in turn distributed sometimes it was reaching on time to the student not reaching through the use of uh, direct beneficiary transfer methodology using what we know aadhar card or udai it has been so easy and smooth every month whenever the money is to go automatically from the account of the government or wherever whatever agency lands up into the account of the student and same is the case with the subsidies which are given to either farmers or the gas subsidy there is no middleman there is no leakage and how it has reached the person at the other end without any uh, you know pilferage uh, which used to happen in the past so i think these are absolutely great case studies for not just india but the whole world i think why and how we will be able to replicate we will be able to make use of such things maybe in africa maybe in other european countries maybe in in places wherever these kind of requirements do exist these can be absolutely case studies as far as the demonetization is concerned there were all kind of uh, criticisms and all that but please remember it has become 
a part of life of ours in terms of digital empowerment by doing digital transactions. The number of transactions have increased phenomenally. And during COVID, we could re really see the effect of that. People now from absolutely rural areas to urban areas, from very poor families to anyone, today has several apps through which they are able to do digital transactions and there is no requirement of currency to be handled at all. So how all of this transformation happened over a short period of time, hardly a year or two, and many case studies can come up during COVID, how different types of uh, engagements between NGOs or educational institutions or state governments, central government, they helped the people in order to overcome the crisis which the whole world faced. But one of the finest examples is in terms of provision of food. When you have lost the job, you don't have any anything to eat, how different social organizations, NGOs, how different types of government, governments, philanthropists, they came forward and no one died because of hunger. People certainly still died because of the COVID uh, extremities which happened in terms of some shortages of medicine or sometimes oxygen supply in some cases and some of them having less immunity, but no one died of hunger. That means the whole society as a one single entity came forward to help each other and which we often say in our own culture that Vasudeva uh, Kutumbakam, the whole world is family and that's why when the vaccine was uh, created in India, in Hyderabad, we said that this vaccine would be also available for the rest of the world and many of the countries were given free and some of them were given with at a cost but certainly we did provide this in the true spirit of Sarve Janaha Sukhino Bhavantu. That means we take care of everyone, the whole world. And similarly, in terms of today, uh, we talk about uh, sustainable development goals, 17 of them, and quite often how education is related with all of these other 16 goals. SDG 4 is for education, but other goals are also equally important, whether it is uh, the, the, uh, the food or hunger, the nature, environment, uh, all of these are in way or one way or the other related and how, uh, whether it is uh, the recycling of various things which we do quite often in our country, much smoother, easier and this problem will never arise in our country, what will happen to the waste, whether it is electronics waste, whether it is the waste which is coming out from the agriculture, whether it is from the automotive, how we are in a position to recycle, you know, I have seen very innovative ideas created by people. Uh, a, a particular motor or particular engine, when its life is over in that particular component, it's taken out, subcomponents, they are all taken out and then you create some other new product out of the waste. So making use of the waste in creating new products is something very great in our country in terms of how these case studies can be done. We have uh, now to concentrate on three, four sectors which are important you know, for case study writing. Health is becoming more and more important. Health was always important. COVID taught us lessons that therefore case studies based on health, health services, variety of them. You know, how do we make use of technology, uh, which Dr. Rajan Saxena was uh, talking about use of technology, whether it is AI, whether it is IoT, whether it is machine learning, whether it is use of drones, whether it is using robots, how health care can be taken care of, reaching the medicine to the unreached, whether it is in terms of uh, even the operations being conducted by robo, all of these are great case studies which are already happening day in and day out, we must create. In terms of agriculture, which is one of the key uh, you know, things for our economy because it's our rural economy, how their uh, uh, you know, income can double, you know, this is what Honorable Prime Minister quite often says, how farmer's income can be doubled, village income can be doubled, tripled and that's how our GDP also indirectly will also improve and increase, not just on the basis of uh, agriculture product, but also value addition to the agriculture product on one side or allied industry which can come up in the rural areas. The third one is very important, which we are all in, is the education sector. Edutech companies, AI-based learning, you know, a student knows something, how students journey to excel in a particular domain can happen based on the prior learning what kind of exercise he has to be given so that 
he or she will start learning from there to reach the same level of uh, outcome as that of someone who has started in the middle you know these are all possibilities in the edutech sector there are huge number of edutech companies which have come each one of those edutech companies itself could be a case by itself you know coming from a very small place a rural area came to a smaller town for doing engineering did it and did not get a job but still struggled and then created a small startup and then rose and some of them have become unicorns in the in the pandemic 41 unicorns being created itself is a case study by itself you know i i don't think any other country in the world in such paralysis of economy can create 41 uh, unicorns so that is another interesting and very important area the transportation you know which is very important for a country of our size both in terms of population and the width and length of the country and therefore whether it is motor therefore electric vehicles therefore charging stations therefore how people can get empowered in terms of not spoiling the environment keeping intact nature but still getting transportation available at their doorstep i think i can go go on giving hundreds and hundreds of examples and one of the finest uh, other case study which i would like that people should do is on the smart india hackathon which we started 4 years ago our honorable prime minister wherever he goes whichever country he talks about it and then we get a task to do of conducting a hackathon between two nations we had had uh, india singapore hackathon we had had uh, india asean hackathon then uh, right now india portugal hackathon was on the cards but unfortunately because of covid got postponed then india africa hackathon is ongoing maybe in june we will have that so this kind of engagement of understanding the problems of the society the government the how do we make the life easy that is what is ease of doing business for that these hackathons have proved to be a great opportunity for young students to create something new and which has become useful and that is where again i link with the bottom of the pyramid so any solution which only will touch the top of the pyramid will not have any business value one which touches the bottom of the pyramid will have huge impact and we have had uh, two three very interesting again uh, case studies which are very very important is in terms of lot of waste of flowers and uh, you know fruits generated in most of the temples you know temples people offer uh, you know flowers and then it is dumped later into the river spoiling the river environment and there have been people who have started recycling these flowers by collecting them in large quantum and then converting it into useful products be it in terms of incense sticks or in terms of uh, manure and this has become a hit business so you have an environmental friendly product developed from out of the waste and created money and wealth out of that and gave jobs i, th- I think these are fantastic ideas which have been coming in we have water purifiers which have come in which are uh, attached to the tap and you get the pure water rather than buying a very expensive water bottle from out of the market and uh, uh, the, uh, the the other innovations uh, i just reflect is about on the whatsapp i have seen many of these uh, uh, edible plate and edible spoons so you take a, uh, rather than taking a plastic plate and throwing and creating disturbance these plates are edible the spoon is edible uh, you take the food whatever item you want to buy then you consume that and also consume the plate itself uh, i think how wonderful it is that uh, therefore innovation has no bound and the smart india hackathon has proved that undergraduate students of second year third year given challenges they come out with brilliant out of the box solutions which we can only slightly mentor them we give them the our experience to them and then try to uh, make it a finished product thereby it will be useful to the society uh, i think i'll i'm done uh, i'm very very thankful to the aima first of all starting the case writing competition and conference and giving opportunity for our students to look for this now i am again telling in all our engineering domain uh, how does innovation happen it is only because of uh, our five senses we also talk about sixth sense uh, some intuition but that's a different one but even the five senses which are there for almost 99% of the people we must make use of them the eyes the ears the tongue the skill all of that all the senses they give us 
lot of uh, information and if we are able to process that information we will be able to create a product or a process which is useful to people and we can also similarly see a case whether it is in a rural area or an agriculture field or in a factory or uh, while going in a railway station on a platform or in a bus stand or in a busy locality there are challenges which someone or the other has addressed in a very unique way which can be converted into a case study thank you very much namaskar thank you sir i'll now invite dr raj agarwal director center for management education ima to propose vote of thanks please first of all sir we are really thankful Uh, to professor uh, anil says budde for his very comprehensive uh, review of all the cases which can be developed and in fact uh, these are the cases uh, which are very much uh, required uh, in uh, in indian b schools and uh, indian faculty members they are definitely going to be motivated by your address they i think that they got lot of ideas because you have covered whole spectrum of change which are taking place and whole areas from bottom to pyramid and to globalization that what are the cases which can be covered and uh, secondly sir we are very thankful for your support because for your, uh, by your support and motivation uh, from very beginning uh, this case research center was set up and uh, you have uh, very kindly associated with us in uh, supporting and conducting various training programs in four corners of india and again each and every time we are getting your very kind support aict is providing us very kind support and we are organizing and uh, uh, doing this conference by your support that itself is very very uh, very very encouraging to us and we are also thankful to professor rajan saxena uh, to be a mentor from very beginning uh, to be a chairperson of this research center and guiding us not only in national collaboration but in international collaboration and also also the also guiding us that how quality cases that can be developed and then this is what that associating uh, top uh, um, uh, top professors like professor raj uh, swasta like professor metri with this case is a center and then not only at international level not only at national level but also at international level so we hope to get your support and motivation in coming years also and with the association of aict and the kind of association which we have developed recently i think that we can achieve the dream of um, of developing 1000 cases as as professor says but they has given to us thank you very much sir for participating thank you we were honored and delighted by the presence of dr anil D Sahasrabuddhi Chairman AICTE thank you so much for joining sir thank you Dr Rajan Saxena and thank you Dr Raj Agarwal Ladies and gentlemen with this we now move on to the second session of the conference future of case method in metaverse is the theme of the session a very warm welcome to a very distinguished panel of speakers for the session session moderator and speaker Dr. Rishikesha T. Krishnan, Director and Professor of Strategy, Indian School, Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore. Our speakers, Professor Indranil Bose, Distinguished Professor, Director of the Area of Excellence in Artificial Intelligence, Data Science, and Business, Neoma Business School, Paris. Professor Rajiv Kumra, Professor of Marketing and Dean, IIM Lucknow. Dr. Geeta Bajaj, Professor. case writing and teaching expert imt dubai and editorial board member ima india case research center with this i hand over the session to dr krishnan uh, thank you uh, good evening and welcome to this uh, session uh, certainly it's a very fascinating topic and uh, i look forward to discussing with our uh, eminent uh, panelists here on this uh, session Uh, we have i think uh, uh, we had originally about 45 minutes but i understand from the organizers that they would still like us to stick to the closing time so that means we actually have 35 minutes now and we have uh, 
three eminent speakers apart from myself. So I think essentially we'll have to request each of the speakers to sort of make their opening remarks in maybe some five or six minutes each so that we allow some time for discussion. Uh, let me just set the stage for the discussion and then I will request the other speakers to come in. Uh, this whole uh, concept of metaphors is of course uh, very fascinating. Uh, it's yet to completely evolve. I think we only have some figments of what it will ultimately be like. Uh, I must say that I'm not perhaps the best person to talk about metaverse. Though I do remember that, you know, in, in around 2005, six kind of time frame, there was a lot of excitement about this new experience called the second life. And many uh, youngsters particularly were setting up their separate life in the second life with their own digital avatars and identities and Personally, I found it quite uh, difficult to be in that for long. I tried for a day or two and then I beat a hasty retreat from there. But if that was any indicator of the potential of metaverse, I think it's certainly a harbinger of uh, things to come. Uh, what, I've, what I have seen in the last few years is that there are several areas where these extended elements of technology are making a big difference. Uh, if I look at virtual reality, for example, uh, I recently visited the training center of one of India's leading motorcycle companies, and I found that they had a lovely VR setup to help people learn how to paint in the paint shop. So essentially, it gave them the experience or a very closely simulated experience in painting, and this helped uh, those people hone their skills very well. So one thing I can see straight away is that there is a significant element of skill training that can happen. But from a management point of view, we are, of course, hoping for much more. Uh, we have all, all been talking quite a bit about games and simulation in the last uh, several years. We've been trying to create real learning experiences for our students that closely reflect what would happen in a corporate environment. One way, of course, this happens is through internships, but we would love to provide something near that in the classroom. While the case method does do that to a certain extent, it would certainly be useful, at least in some areas. I can see, for example, the behavioral domain as one area in which having this kind of a virtual platform in which you could actually have interactions with people, learn from the experience without personally having to go through either the trauma or the excitement of those personal exchanges. I think that could go a long way in things like team building and individual leadership development and so on. So that's one area where I see a lot of scope. Similarly, in strategy, we already have good games, but the behavioral aspects don't really come out that well. And uh, we know that whether it be finance or economics, behavioral dimensions are playing a much larger role in all that we study and read and so on. So overall, I think Metaverse certainly has significant potential to alter the way we teach. Now, the title of this session is Future of Case Method in Metaverse. So that's another complication. It's not about the metaverse alone. It's also about the case method and what will happen to the case method in metaverse. So here I'd make only just two comments. One is that one of the challenges with cases has always been that most of the time they are retrospective. They look at things that happened much earlier. Students have concerns about the currency and relevance of many of the cases. One approach to address this has been, for example, the raw case approach started by Yale School of Management, where they tried to create much more open-ended cases without all the nice editing and the very neat appearance of say a Harvard Business School case. But those cases, of course, became quite unwieldy, difficult to teach in the classroom. So I think the whole challenge of making cases more realistic, more reflecting current reality still remains. And undoubtedly, if the metaverse can help us do that in a better way, uh, I look forward to that. Video cases, of course, have done it in a small way. But even video cases are once again recordings of things that's happened in the past. So metaverse, I think, does offer the potential of things happening in real time between real participants, of course, with their digital avatars in multidimensional digital spaces. But this should be quite exciting. So I think I will stop here with these brief opening remarks.
Uh, I will now uh, turn to my uh, fellow panelists. Uh, I would like to request uh, Professor Geeta Bajaj. Would you like to go next, please? Uh, and give us your perspective on this future of case method in metaverse. Thank you, Dr. Krishnan, um, for calling me in. And I, I join you in saying that I am no expert in this, but I'm very delighted to speak on this because and what is my thought on what I see in the future about it. So just to give a, a head start, I think uh, we started with, uh, with uh, like Mark Zuckerberg in his uh, keynote about the metaverse uh, and Facebook says we started with text and we were okay with it. And then we moved on to pictures and then we moved on to video and then video was very fine. And then the virtual reality, and now they are creating this whole world where you can transact, do business, you'll have your avatars, avatars can move from one social reality to another social reality, and um, a new world that they're planning to, to create. Uh, so virtual reality, augmented reality, and then the metaverse, right? So we are talking of... Uh, a, like what you shared today, one could do a flight simulator, a driving simulator, a pain simulator, which is where we are alone and we are learning something through that reality. And then we become a part of that reality. And then in metaverse, we can even transact with others in that. And, and that is the next uh, level of technology I understand we are looking at. Um, why we are talking about it today is because we are trying the, the conversation is that when it came to using technology for teaching and education, perhaps the field of education has not taken those strides uh, as fast as many other, uh, you know, industries and domains took technology. Like they embraced technology and really moved forward, but the education sector did not embrace technology as much as it could. So in the metaverse world now, the conversation is also that is the education world going to accept that technology is a reality and can we use it for augmenting the way we impart education. In the field of science, in the field of history, in the field of, um, uh, you know, uh, places where a lot of empathy is, is needed, there is conversation that it will make a big difference. So to just to give an example, uh, when I think of, uh, um, uh, you know, a world, for instance, if, if I were to talk to somebody about develop, developing countries and how one needs to be understanding what is the reality, let's say today if I want somebody to understand the pain of someone who is in a you know poorer economy and they go through a pain so what do we do right now we show a picture of a of a child maybe who's who's malnourished or we show something which is uh, which is a visual or a little video that we see now think of it a person can walk into that area and actually experience somebody who is lining up for water in the morning and not getting water is not having the facilities that we easily have listening to that and being a part of that uh, can be two different experiences. So like what you said for behavioral sciences, when you make somebody a part of that reality, it, it may become a reality which, which you experience better and you can empathize better. So one thing which I see uh, metaverse is making a difference is that metaverse uh, can make people empathize more visualize more, conceptualize more. If I want to talk to, so there are already universities across the world. Let's say I know of Columbia University, they have those grants and they are working. They have uh, this huge budget, which is on doing experiments and research to find out how much difference it's making to the learning, right? So if I'm having a, control group and uh, which is uh, doing a normal the virtual or metaverse then is it making a difference to exams in which they are appearing or the um, you know the uh, uh, scores that they are getting at the end and these are all studies which are still happening I don't know what will be the results of those but I can imagine that if for instance in a country like India and I'm moving now from obvious domains science or for example, 
chemistry if i were to visualize how the carbon atoms would combine and how would they finally change today when we watch a video which is able to make us see the molecules the atoms the combination and how it changes what are colors etc the understanding is far better with the videos than what we would have got from our two dimensional or, or one dimensional books that we had or for that matter we've all grown up learning history which was only through learning cramming dates and learning some stories but now understanding history through documentaries is definitely a greater better way of learning now becoming a part of it like you know you can actually walk into a world which is a which is created like a greek a uh, greek uh, city and then you are walking in that city and you're interacting with people who are dressed like that who are talking like that who are talking of the gods of the greek gods and, and then you come out of it and then you get into the into another world where you are going to do an excavation and find out whether the city existed or not so the kind of learning you can do there is immense now coming to the business world the the world that we are talking about today let's say about our cases i'm just thinking that there are a large number of our students who come for example directly out of college let's say they do engineering and they come into management schools etc i am talking of an industry i'm talking of global companies i'm talking of global industries we give them cases to read and we expect them to read and, and understand what that company would be like how they function what is the culture let's say i'm talking of organizational culture and how culture is different in different companies right in different industries is different so if i am going into a production into a uh, into a manufacturing industry or i am going into a service industry the culture is different now can i take my students through those companies and then have them experience what they are like and how that culture is different right it can be a very different experience uh, to be understanding what it is like to have an organizational culture which is um which, which is for example uh, the same across like you know there is an organizational culture which is very strong as against an organizational culture which is uh, which is quite fragmented and every department is different people think differently etc now if you can become a part of that world and experience it uh, the 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 learning can be very different um so like what you said as of now we have small videos that people can watch Uh, if at any point of time we are going to have uh, the metaverse become a reality for the education sector i'm just thinking last I, i'll be quick in wrapping up supposing that there is a case i want to bring to the class which is talking about crisis right now right now what a student does is reads up a crisis case and then comes up with suggestions on what can be done what decisions to be made etc we want the students to read up get a feeling get an understanding be in the shoes of the protagonist and then make the decisions right now if instead of that the student can actually get into that world can really see the feel the pressure of a ceo as to you know when they're saying that these supplies from china have be blocked and we have supplies only for this much time what are the alternate supply chains if you, and what is the pressure as a result but we don't have people who can come in because they are already not available because of covid and we can't have anyone in and the government regulation is coming so there's that pressure building up and now you you are the ceo there's another cfo there is another uh, crisis team there is another and you are making those teams so bringing in from the simulations that we are creating like you said strategy simulations uh, that we have to having a real world around it in which we are interacting and transacting and then coming out so i don't think the whole learning can be but it does give you a feel uh, at this point of time as far as i can see you get a feel of it then you come out then the, there is a discussion in the classroom where you talk about it maybe there is another scenario where the teacher wants to take you and then you again go in and you experience that and you come out and then of course you have to do your own uh, learning which is there which is coming through discussions which is coming through ways um it could be in the metaverse universities like everybody is already there in it and then but i still don't see uh, that taking the place of the real interaction that we can have amongst ourselves so um i think there is huge potential i think it's we are just at the very surface of the entire thing i think it's 
still very far off. How far off, I don't know. But I know that in 1990, when I was doing electronics and communications engineering, and I had a subject called networking, and I still remember me standing with a whole lot of my friends talking, why do you need a mobile phone? Why can't you go inside and make a phone call? And why do we have to study a subject on networking? Where is the point in having a mobile phone? I mean, from a time when we thought, why do you need a mobile phone to a date where you can't think of stepping out of your house uh, without a mobile phone? A lot of times you're not able to see the potential of technology. But now I think all of us have seen oh, the immense potential that technology brings. And uh, perhaps this is the next thing that we're going to see, especially when very big names like Facebook and HP and Microsoft and everybody have announced such huge money that they are putting into making it a reality. It may not be very, you know, it may not be not possible. I'm not saying very close. It's still a very, very expensive thing and it's still a, the very beginning stage, but uh, I do see this coming. So uh, that's my initial thought about it. Yeah, Dr. Thank you, Krishna. Professor Bajaj. Yeah, sure. So if I can request uh, Professor Indranil Bose to come in and just to ensure that we have some at least time for a couple of questions, could I just request you to stick to about six minutes, please? Uh, I would like to thank Kaima for inviting me for the session and thank you to uh, Professor Krishnan for calling me next. Um, I'll share some views about uh, Metaverse and then how it relates to the uh, case method of uh, learning. Um, I have been uh, researching you know, augmented reality, virtual reality, extended reality for some time now. And uh, with some of the experiences uh, that we have with research in the context of uh, why people prefer augmented reality or virtual reality in the e-commerce space. Uh, we find that you know, uh, people usually feel that an augmented reality experience gives you a sense of immersion, a sense of being there, and it also satisfies our various senses. And at the same time, it reduces feeling of uncertainty that we have about anything that we are going to buy or purchase or do. So uh, Metaverse um, is a sort of you know, culmination of this extended reality in terms of augmented mixed or virtual reality. And hopefully it will uh, give us a feeling of immersion and being there and experiencing this immersiveness will give us a better understanding of the entire thing that is happening around us. Now, um, how is this useful for uh, case teaching, learning, et cetera? As you know, I know a case method is primarily about social learning, learn in the presence of others by discussing things with others and also uh, seeing how others are responding to certain situations. Now, if you uh, transform this to the metaverse, I don't see that the entire case method will go to metaverse just like that, it will probably be a mixture of the classical method of case teaching learning, uh, whereby you read a portion of the case study from some materials. And then you see certain parts of the case being acted out like we currently do in videos. Um, also getting inside the case story and type of interacting uh, with the key protagonist inside. It. So it is possible that the uh, tension that builds up in the case study, you are able to experience it much better than learning it uh, when you are uh, reading uh, the case study. So you are able to see the protagonist in person, how they look like, their bodily expressions, gestures, their emotions of their faces, etc. Uh, while you are experiencing the metaverse world. So of course, it enhances your sense of being there in many different ways. So you might enjoy it much better and also your learning about the situation might be much better because what you learn by reading uh, may be quite different from what you learn by seeing, observing and being there. So at, in, on one side, I think the metaverse environment has uh, can make our case descriptions uh, much more illustrative, much more immersive and much richer and the students might like it better. But I don't see that Metaverse will completely displace the traditional classical method of case learning. There has to be the inverted pyramid model of case learning. You start with industry, you go with you know, different firms, you look at their challenges, and then 
you also look at the exact situation that unfolds for the decision makers or the protagonists. So all of those things will be there, but it will be much more experiential. Also, technology can allow you to have different kinds of progress uh, for the outcome of what happens in your interaction with the protagonists for different people. So it does not have to be the same case study for everyone. It could be different case studies for uh, different participants based on how they interact with the protagonist or what they sense about the protagonist. So this interactive feeling, immersive feeling, and also the richness that comes along with it actually could make this a very fulfilling experience for our students. For teachers, it would be a much more difficult environment because you, know, you lose control by putting people in this multimedia, multidimensional environment. But at the same time, I hope the overall learning will be much better and the enjoyment uh, factor that comes in learning will also be much higher uh, when we uh, move people into the augmented reality, virtual reality and extended reality environments. That's all from inside. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Bose. Uh, may I request Professor Rajiv Kumra, please? Yeah, hi, good evening and uh, thanks to Aima and uh, thank you, Professor uh, Tukesh for giving me an opportunity. Uh, I have uh, <clears throat> Rajiv, sorry to interrupt. Your voice is a bit faint. I don't know if it's a problem only with me or others are also facing that. Am I audible now? Can much you better. hear me now? Yeah, much better. <clears throat> so, first of all, uh, thanks and good evening to all of you. And thanks to Aima and thanks to Professor Rishikesh for giving me an opportunity to speak about it. I will not take more than five minutes. And uh, as far as I am concerned, I will play a role of a devil's advocate. And uh, I'm not a very great fan of. Uh, this metaverse because I have a mixed feeling. I will give you a couple of reasons for that. I have seen, I have written cases, I have dealt with cases in classrooms and I'm a very traditional teacher who picks up a chalk and write on a blackboard and yet quite successful. So I have seen that time from moving from a case study to a video cases to simulation and I've used everything in the classroom. And I find that when you use simulation as rightly said by Professor Indran Bose, there is a lot of advantage which comes with it and possibly Metaverse cases will also bring that, which is experiential learning, motivation of the students will be high because they will have a flow, what we call as in our technical terms, they will have a flow, they will have excitement around it because there is a lot of other motivation elements. For example, you can have leather boards, you can have points, you can have reward systems, all those things can be a positive. But imagine my own research tells that I'm working on a video game issues in children. And if a video game is creating so much of troubles, which include health, which include various other uh, learning issues. So that's not, everything is not that good as it looks like. More importantly, what will happen in metaverse is that there are three things, which is knowledge, skill, and attitude. And I have a serious doubt that all three will get impacted when we get into metaverse and augmented reality or virtual learning. Please understand, in my personal opinion, AR, VR is good to sell products to have advertisements, to sell something on Metaverse, which is what is being done by precisely by these commercial organizations. But as a professor, our job is to create knowledge and understanding. Going into virtual reality where there is nothing at stake because students don't have anything at stake. And look, there is a lot of issues which are happening. One is a privacy issue. The second is a security issue. There is already a lot of arguments which is happening about sexual harassment, which is happening on Metaverse. Apart, apart from that, India will take possibly many decades to get into that because there is a huge poor infrastructure. Not many schools are equipped. We are not talking about elite schools like IIT and IIM. So I'm talking about uh, typical schools which are still struggling to get even a case studies in their classrooms. And we are talking about a next leap, which is a metaverse. So there's nothing wrong about metaverse, but as rightly said by the other part, other two panelists, I also agree that metaverse can be an add-on can be a substantial add-on to the total learning, but can, can never be a replacement to the real case study because there is nothing at stake. When our students have been playing simulation game, I have seen them, they play it. And after that, when you ask them about the learning, they say it was a game for us because they burned their money, but they were never accountable for it. So that is what possible will happen at Metaverse. But in the real world, it doesn't happen. When you work for a company, there is a protagonist, you get into the shoes, you take a decision and you live with that. So I think that accountability, how it will come. So possibly metaverse world requires a lot of fine tuning. The AR and VR requires a lot of fine tuning. Let it first get successful in the commerce world. Once it is done, then it should be brought to education. Why simple? Because we are dealing with a young mind who are impressionable and who are more issues of privacy and security, specifically in schools and in business schools. 
So henceforth, I think metaverse should come in the last of the schools. So with this, I close my comment. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, thanks a lot to all the speakers. Uh, some very interesting ideas have come in. Uh, thank you, Professor Kumra, for raising some uh, of the challenges with metaverse. That was very useful. So I think we now have a few questions, and I'm going to take up a couple of them in the time that we have. Uh, the first question, uh, which is from Samyadeep Kundu, and uh, his question is: I feel the application of the case method in the metaverse takes the case writing into a case production with the writer taking the role of the writer and the director. For a case writer exploring this new domain, what qualities are likely to make for a successful and effective case? So essentially, this question is about what will it take to be a good case writer in the metaverse? Uh, would any of you like to take this uh, question? Who would like to take a shot? Yeah, I, <clears throat> I would like to take it. Yeah, please. It's going to be a lot immersive and flow, as rightly said by Professor Indriel. So there are two, three things which we talk about, which is immersion and flow. So how do you get the attention of the students on metaverse? Uh, because they will have a lot of distractions. So how do you act as a protagonist and yet get the attention of the students? Because they will possibly not like to come back into the classrooms because uh, once they have experienced that particular world, and how do you engage them? Because there will be a lot of distractions there. And uh, so how do you make them accountable is another thing. How do you assess them on the assessments? Because it is not that easy because we have a lot of complex matrix. So how are we going to do that? These are things which we need to answer other than the case study. So how the discussion will happen, how you will set the floor, how we will create the classrooms. All these things is what I think is uh, going to be an issue. Yeah, Professor Bajaj, please go ahead. You need to unmute yourself first. Please go ahead. Okay, so two things quickly. I think the, uh, the one thing about production and being part of that production, I do uh, think that it will not be an individual, but it will have to be a production house, which will have a case writer and a director. The same person could assume both the rules. You could have two different people. We don't know how it will happen, but just as we watch for movies and all, it cannot be a one person doing in case writer will be the writer as in for a movie. Right? And we will need some extra skill, different skill for doing that writing. So that, uh, I think that to that question, um, it would be a production house in which we will be one of the players as faculty. Uh, the other uh, Dr. Kumra's uh, uh, remark, I would like to bring in some interesting thing to, to contradict him and then let's see what comes out of it. And I think both of us are conjecturing. So it's okay to, if it, if we have the time for me to comment on that, Dr. Krishnan, with your permission. Yeah, please go ahead. Sure. Mm. So um, uh, I think that um, I, I, so I once invited a, a uh, you know, a company which is into augmented reality and they create educational programs for uh, for classrooms. And I invited them to my to my learning and development class. I teach a course on learning and development and for trainings, how do they use that? So that is the purpose I invited them. Uh, they, they immediately, you put on a headset and the goggles and we were transported in a world where there was the entire galaxy around and you could stand there and watch the, the earth, the sand, you have to identify the planet and you have to identify different and as you walk through it was an amazing experience the students spent some 10 minutes everybody of course it was the first time so everybody was very excited to use and see and you would trip over each other when you are walking in that reality and stuff but so 15 minutes, and I see no harm in that, you know, even in a case class, if it is an immersive experience that we are wanting to create, if there is a, if there is a platform which is able to create that immersive experience for the student, and the student can experience that, and then we come out and do the discussion, so it can never replace the discussion, it, I, I don't think at least at this point of time, it can replace the discussion, the debate, the analysis that you have to do everything, but getting that that re the reality of that situation through this immersive experience, I think is going to add on to the learning. Okay, thank you, Professor Bose. Did you want to add something? It, it won't be a distraction. It will be an added learning is what sure. I would say. Thank you. Yeah, I would like to say that, uh, you know, this is uh, indeed a very difficult endeavor to do the case teaching you know, through the metaverse. 
I think it is only for the brave heart to venture into it because as it is, we struggle quite a bit to write a good case and make it interesting. But here technology comes to your rescue by uh, allowing you to create uh, this interactive uh, sense, which our newer generation, um, you know, the Gen Zs actually like to experience. So of course it caters to their learning method much better. But um, as some of us who have kind of grown with the classical method of case teaching and learning, uh, it would be quite a challenge actually to be the writer as well as the movie director. And I think yeah. it's not an easy task and uh, we have to kind of retrain ourselves if we have to create good metaverse case studies. The challenge is there and it is for us whether we want to do it. Wonderful. So let's go to the next question. This is from Sushant. With the decreasing engagement time of reading, we moved from text to video and then on to AR, VR, MR, etc. Will the immersive experience of metaverse assessed for quicker learning? Your opinion, please. So I'll take that first. Um, yes, Professor Bush, I, go ahead. I, I, I feel that uh, indeed, uh, you know, with the students that I have uh, taught, you know, starting from the undergraduates to the executives, I think, uh, you know, um, live experience um, is something that everyone look for. And that's why people are into case studies. Well, after all, it is a simulated situation looking back into the past and re-experiencing the thing. But if you can do it visually, mentally, you know, bodily, then I think uh, there is, you know, nothing better than that. I'll give the example of a case study that uh, we all talk about in information systems of security breaches and how that happens. And it's a very complex technology that plays out and you know security breach happens and entire organization gets affected. Now, if you are being transported into the exact day, time, when the security breach happened and how it in, you know, kind of affected all the people involved in the company, I think your learning will be much, much better. So there is no question that this immersion will give a much more deeper impact and you know, learning that you can take with yourself. But it is for us to create that experience, which will make this immersive experience truly real and which will help us understand the context much better. I think one of the, the question here is, is it quicker? Professor Kumra, uh, what do you think? Uh, quicker, yes. Uh, long lasting also, yes. But the question is that, uh, can we transmit the complex things onto the metaverse is the issue. So <clears throat> there are certain things which need to be taught, for example, concepts. So uh, can Metaverse do it? So experience and concrete concepts abstract. So there is a lot of things in the subject which we teach. It is just not an experience. So how are we going to teach that through a Metaverse? So still the same way lecture is going to conduct. Uh, there is a lot of things which we experience, but there's a lot of things which are absolute concrete abstracts, which we have to believe in anyways. Okay, I'm going to go on to the last question, I think. I'm not able to read the name of the person because it's got truncated by Zoom. So if you don't mind, I'll just go with the question. While the digital video tech has been available to us for more than 25 years now, even to bring in some good video cases, we have not been very successful. It seems too far-fetched to adopt Metaverse. It might take at least one more decade before it becomes practical. Uh, any thoughts? Uh, maybe Professor Bose, you're the tech expert here from what I can see from your profile. Uh, well, I don't think it will take a decade uh, because um, many years ago, you know, um, Harvard released the case on the terror attacks of Mumbai and it was a full video case, live experiencing of what happened uh, during the terror attacks. Um, so this full video case concept actually uh, came in much faster than what we anticipated. Similarly, a lot of cases on Harvard have moved to simulations in my space of analytics and data science. I think there are some of the simulation cases on analytics which are really beautifully done and uh, which give the experience of understanding and experiencing data much better. So uh, people are making their conscious effort to make this experiential learning much better, closer to what our new generations of uh, learners actually need. So I'm hopeful that you know people will experiment this. There will be failures, but we will innovate. We will learn from our failures and continue to innovate and finally come to a situation where uh, the metaverse cases or mixed metaverse and paper and video cases will become the norm rather than only the text-based cases. I'm pretty hopeful that you know this is coming pretty soon. Um, although it may be in a very raw form or um, not so good form, but I mean, it will change with time. It may evolve and it will become 
are the one that we really want to see. Professor Kumra, what's your prediction? Yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> India will take some time. I agree with it. Uh, it is because uh, if you look at the ground reality, which is very, very different than what we as a panelist are discussing here, because India is a poor country, I still stick to my word. India is a poor country. Go to the small business schools. They are struggling to even teach a case study. Forget about video cases. They don't have access to video cases. And now if you go to any of the schools, be it Harvard even, they don't have any case on metaverse. They also have a limited number of video cases. And if you want, you can calculate the number of ratio of the X cases versus video cases. That will make it very clear and obvious. And how many simulation games they have. If you calculate that ratio over the number of text cases which they have, that makes it very, very apparent that even the professors at Harvard and all those are still struggling. They are not still taking video cases. They are all very, very much uh, countable in numbers. So metaverse will come for sure, but it will be a supplementary education because the, the whole thing which I'm afraid of is that the student's attention should not get into more like a game, you know, when like in simulation it is happening. They play it like a game rather than as a learning uh, tool. So, so that's what should not happen. This is the point. Yes, so Professor Bajaj, your final prediction, please. Well, I think um, while I would love it to come early, but I agree with Dr. Kumra, it's still, um, in my view, I think it's still quite far off. The And especially in the real, in terms of interactions which are there on the, uh, on the net, we're talking of bandwidths, which are very, very, very different from what we have today. Today, we are even struggling with the basics, you know. So I still think it's going to take some time before it becomes a reality. And plus then creating those many cases and every case is very expensive. It's a very expensive technology. So I do think it's going to take some time before it becomes a reality. We will start experiencing it a little bit, but still a time to come. It'll take Thank time. you. Yeah, so that's very fascinating. Uh, I, don't, I don't think we all completely understand what this metaverse will finally look like. At least I don't. I suspect many of us still have to see how it unfolds. So let me thank uh, the panelists for their very interesting contributions. And let me once again thanks Aima for putting, thank Aima for putting this panel together and let me return you to the organizers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Krishnan. Uh, many thanks to Prof uh, Professor Bose, uh, Professor Kumra, Dr. Geeta Bajaj. We are immensely benefited by your address and your views. Thank you so much, dear panel. With this, we now move on to this next session. Quality assurance in case teaching is the theme of the session next. It's my pleasure to invite a very eminent panel to speak on the topic. Dr. Jyotsna Bhatnagar, Professor, Organizational Behavior and Human Resource Management, Dean Research, MDI as a moderator. Our speakers are Dr. Vipin Gupta, Professor and Co-Director, Center for Global Management California State University, San Bernardino, Jack Brown College of Business and Public Administration, USA, Professor Fancio Terence, Adjunct Professor Robert Kennedy College, Zurich, Switzerland, Director of Open Programs, Senior Advisor to the Dean Africa Business School. With this, I hand over the session to Dr. Jyotsna Bhatnagar. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Anuja and Dr. Sonia. Uh, welcome to Dr. Vipin Gupta and friends and uh, Dr. Frank Theron. Welcome to this. I will say in Hindi, Namaste. Welcome to India for this uh, particular session. And we will look into uh, your wisdom of how do we do and how are we looking at the cutting edge of uh, you know, ensuring quality assurance of cases in class, especially when students find it difficult to read long uh, cases and we're coming into short, crisp, brief cases and yet make a point, yet make it uh, specific and yet make them learn. Of course, there is a trend of video cases which has come in after Harvard Business Review uh, actually went on to do the 2611 uh, the unsung heroes of the Taj. Uh, so these are video cases. So what is your, uh, in your, uh, you know, wisdom, how do you 
proposed to ensure that the cases maintain the quality that they are meant to from a practical, real world, vicarious learning point of view. To, I would uh, ask Dr. Vipin Gupta to give his uh, uh, you know, views on that and then uh, uh, Professor Therry. So thank you, uh, Dr. Bhatnagar. Uh, I'm going to just briefly uh, take a few minutes. Uh, so when we talk about quality assurance in teaching, uh, the first questions uh, we need to consider is what does quality assurance mean to you as faculty, administrator, a creator, employer, a scholar, which is case author, and a student. And second set of questions is who, why, and how of quality assurance in teaching in case teaching. Uh, what is quality assurance? Uh, I'm going to give a, a view here. A quality assurance is the process of assuring that the qualities being illuminated through case teaching can be reproduced by students by making a qualitative difference in their life and career. Uh, let's take the case of Neera Modi, who colluded with Punjab National Bank officials to take $4 billion of funds against fraudulent letters of undertaking for making payments to overseas suppliers with no intention of paying those funds to the bank. Now, what qualities does this case teach? It teaches the quality of collusion. It teaches the quality of fraudulent undertaking. It teaches the quality of extravagance and the great life you can have. It teaches you uh, the quality of uh, evaluating social benefits of reproducing the work qualities as long as they are reproducible. And finally, the social cost of reproducing the other qualities independent of whether they are reproducible or not. Uh, so if uh, we revisit the question, what's the probability of 100% certainty that Nira Modi's model of social benefit is less than social cost for a worker reproducing that model? So a lot of people might think that uh, the benefits of uh, following Nira Modi is very high and uh, let's follow him. Uh, what's the probability that 100% students have the certainty in mind that uh, it's not beneficial to follow a Nira Modi model? But the quality for employer is not student ability to evaluate both social benefit and social cost or socially undesirable qualities and making a contingent decision not to reproduce when the social benefit cost ratio is below par. So that's not the, the quality of case teaching. So for a, case, for a scholar, uh, the, what's important is who is the protagonist? Uh, is protagonist Neera Modi, who subjectively decided that worker social benefits uh, of uh, 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 in, exceed social cost, and uh, therefore kind of his model is what they're producing for everybody? Or is protagonist Narendra Modi, who objectively decided that the social cost of Neera Modi's model uh, are unacceptable and led to the tightening of bank oversight? Right, and uh, therefore, kind of he made Narendra Modi model of qualities that worth reproducing. Or is protagonist the student who must decide the ways to further the social benefits of the entire eco economic system that we are creating in the nation without the social cost of the national system of administration? Because uh, when we involve kind of for this tightening and government and regulation and governance, uh, that means extra cost, and uh, the student is has to take responsibility of creating an economic system which avoids these costs. So now, ultimately, kind of, uh, a researcher has to decide uh, kind of, uh, what's quality assurance in case teaching. Many faculty in India ask, if we are super teachers, what's the need for us to be a super researcher as well? If we are still trying to be a super teacher, where is the time for us to be a researcher? If the nation has significant shortage of teachers, isn't it a waste of resources to invest in research when 75% do not have access to college education? So a researcher asks the question, do the nation's faculty have the capability to ensure 100% access to college education for those graduating from high schools if the nation's investment in research were to be reallocated for this purpose after the research is accomplished? There has to be a timeline when the research is accomplished. You cannot say that research will continue forever and therefore, it, 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 its findings can never be implemented. Uh, so if, if capability is not the impediment, then what qualities the present approach to case teaching is not helping produce? It's not helping produce confidence in the students, conviction, goal orientation, and clarified consciousness or gifted potential. So why must there be a quality assurance of the national model of case teaching? So question is, is there a well-researched national model of case teaching? 
The answer is no nation has a model of case teaching except the US, where Harvard model of case teaching has become de facto national model and has been adapted by different institutions and faculty to their local imperatives. And we know the Harvard model that uh, these case facts are not meant to show whether this is the right way of doing things or uh, acceptable way of doing things. Uh, we make no value judgments, right? But uh, the opportunity, the India's ancient wisdom is grounded in case teaching, Panchantra, which clearly has a very clarified consciousness. Uh, and uh, it's a sentient quality, a conscious quality of what qualities in the case are appropriate for life and what qualities are not. So it's not the Harvard model. It's the Indian model that we have forgotten, right? Uh, so the 12 parameters for designing national model, I'm going to go just on a few of them. First, uh, understanding the issue that different actors perceive the situation differently, leading to their varying performing and profiting. And the theory uh, accounting for perceptual variations, first varying value proper, uh, priorities shape planning, for instance, priority on value of sustainability. Varying belief priorities shape programming. Is sustainability pro compatible with profiting? Varying practice priorities shape performing. For instance, priority on researching, uh, the, the one who theorized that sustainability is compatible with profiting after investigating the experience of one who ascended profiting by developing the sustainability value. So there has, there's a scientist uh, who researches uh, a practitioner who is already doing this. Right and varying decision priorities shape profiting. Is one investing in developing a sustainable model of profiting or a profitable model of sustainability? So uh, then asking what's the ideal? So which model do you prefer as a protagonist? Uh, do you prefer the planning model where you prioritize sustainability unconditionally as a philosopher or the programming model where you prioritize sustainability if compatible with profiting, which is conditional model as a practitioner the performing model where you prioritize trading of extrinsic know-how for managing a limiting condition. So if, if somebody has been able to do it, then we will be able to do it as a scientist, okay, who's always looking outside. And the profiting model where you prioritizing servicing of extrinsic know-how as intrinsic know-how for profiting from your value of sustainability. So you created value, but you had somebody else show you how to do it, okay, as an educator. So understanding the causation that uh, one has to understand the cultural origins of this. The planning model is popular in Anglo cluster. It's an assertive culture. So the value of sustainability is unconditional. The programming model is popular in Germanic cluster. It's the future oriented cl culture. It prioritizes things where the things can be compatible. Performing model is popular in Confucian Asia. It's a performance oriented culture and profiting model is popular in Southern Asia. It's a very individualistic culture uh, with uh, kind of uh, collectivistic uh, ideals. Then there's the effects of each one of them, right? Uh, and that we need to understand. There are consequences, for instance, a planning model. So if you unconditionally value sustainability and you don't know how to do it, so what do you do? You globalize the South Asian profiting model by free riding on the South Asian Gurutva to become Vish Guru. So America has become Vish Guru, right? By free riding on kind of getting all Indians to share their knowledge. Similarly, Programming model uniquely localized the Confucian Asian performing model by externalizing all the proliferating problems from Germany and Europe and West to Confucian Asia factory and internalizing their clean solutions after Kaizen. Okay, so, so now China has become polluted, West has become cleansed. So uh, in terms of understanding the technique by servicing the followership credit to you, I gain fair rights for trading a leadership credit from you. So if you are willing to become a follower and follow the Harvard model, I will take the leadership and sell you the Harvard model. So they are understanding the alternatives to market development. Management model is indoctrinate Vasudeva Kutukam value within the universe of followers. So they joyfully become agents promoting the trading of followership credit for the sake of their global family. Now, Step 10 is understanding the child's gifted potential. The ideal model is to educate our children on how to leverage their gifted potential for satisfying everyone so that they realize that uh, their divine potential for helping everybody. Or the real model, we educate our children how to leverage their gifted potential for the absolute realization of their power to be anyone they wish to be. Self-awareness of their sentient potential, the conscious potential. Okay, so uh, 
here can just some of the books which are written on this uh, con uh, in terms of Indian wisdom and going deeper into integration of that with modern science. Uh, but the final comment is that uh, we, what we really need is an international model of case teaching because case teaching is the heart of management education. There's an urgent need for IMA to collaborate with national management associations around the world for developing an international model of case teaching. So. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Vipin Gupta. I have a certain question on the philosophy that you share. One in the national model that you said. Uh, well, that, uh, you know, everybody has to be developing cases and case teaching uh, and uh, case and teaching notes from faculty. But when, of course, you're following the American model, but when uh, we ask younger faculty, it is their more towards you know research papers rather than cases as a pedagogy we of course at mbi or other institutes we encourage them to write cases and contextual cases on indian and asian pacific cases so that they can be used in the in the in the class i still remember professor tv rao ram amdabad telling me that jotsa why don't why are we why reading hbr cases why can't we write our own cases and we started we were encouraged from that time 1990s onwards to write our own cases and our pedagogy but our system doesn't recognize the cases as much as they do the research papers and our young scholars they do because we have to write cases so one pedagogical tool is being used but others is not so again we have to change the system to see the change happening and percolating where we do that plus the other point that you make is because we are following the western philosophy right that we have forgotten the panchatantra and we've forgotten the wisdom of uh, our own uh, uh, ancient philosophy and values of india and we try to get them into cases but then they, we had cases because we were studying it we have got the harvardized model that we are doing it so in your opinion how do we you know ask the system again to recognize even the research done by a case writer is recognizable, which some of our institutes recognize, but everybody doesn't do it because teaching of uh, 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 teaching is a teaching factory, and then research, yes, but in research, research papers, three cases, okay, maybe that is what the reality is. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nagar. I agree with you. Uh, you are. You raised that two different questions uh, because the session is on case teaching, right? So yes. you, you raised the question on case writing and case yeah. authorship. Uh, and uh, then you raised the question of uh, the case teaching. My comments were focused on case teaching element. So even in the case so, teaching, uh, what uh, we, uh, sir, sir, may I? In the Harvard School, we've been uh, trained by the Harvard School where you have to write your case and then you have to teach your case. If you can't do that and get that input into your case and then make it there. So yeah absolutely exactly so so that's a, a fantastic comment uh, so what you're showing is that uh, there's a integration of both those right so the yes. link between case authorship and case teaching and uh, uh, and that's a very important point because uh, why that perspective is there in the us uh, because uh, you bring certain values to case authorship and uh, so unless uh, when you start teaching a case and even if you decide to pick a case from a newspaper or from any other place, right? Uh, given the cost constraints, you may decide to pick things in an open access way. The question is that what values are you bringing in? And uh, is there a clarity? If you don't have that clarity, uh, you cannot convey that clarity in your teaching uh, to the students. And uh, so, so that's the challenge in the, when the Harvard model of case writing and case authorship says that these cases are meant just for discussion. And, uh, and uh, we, do not, uh, we do not claim whether this is the appropriate way of doing things or not appropriate way of doing things. Then the reader, in immature mind, is left to a lot of open interpretation. And that's what I said, uh, if you teach a Nira Modi's case, what's the certainty that 100% of students will decide that Nira Modi's model is not one to follow? A lot of people might, some people at least may decide that uh, the benefits of a Nira Modi model in terms of being with celebrities, being all this is, is far more, a, a two minutes of fame is far more kind of beneficial for us than uh, uh, so sort of uh, the life uh, after that, uh, which we haven't, uh, we don't know whether that's going to happen or not. 
But so, then it's a very important point that you make because unless you tell them about Nirav Modi and what are the ways, how would they know what is to be followed and not to be followed? They need exactly. to Exactly. So, so in Panstantra, and that's very clear. It, there's no confusion of a Harvard case type and Harvard case type works because the faculty who's writing is teaching at Harvard. But yeah. everywhere else, that's not the case. Uh, throughout the US, some people are working on their own cases and they're teaching it. But in India, we are teaching Harvard cases and the cases written by others without knowing the values and without clarifying those values. So that is why I said that it is changing uh, Harvard cases plus our own cases published at Harvard is happening, but it's happening slowly. So we're talking of the contextual one, which Professor T. V. Rao had said way back in 1990, get to write more Indian cases with the, all the Asia Pacific cases so that you are context specific issues you are bringing out in class to be discussed. That is why it's happening a little bit slowly, but it's happening. Definitely. Thank you so much, Dr. Mukta. I will open it to the audience after, uh, or I, I can open it to the audience just now. Any any questions, you can put it in the ch chat, which I think Venkate Shuma has, young academics have to learn an incentive system promoted by national regulators, which does not give any weight to case writing, but all the points are given to research papers. Yeah, that is what I was referring to, that that is happening a lot, and that is why there is an importance from the regulator point of view to give uh, importance to case writing and case teaching, because unless you write your own case, how will you know and teach your own case? Because you would do it with more conviction than you do a, a case that you've brought up from Harvard or others there. Any other question the audience has before we move on to the uh, our uh, next uh, speaker? Any questions that you have with Dr. from Dr. Vipin Gupta, anybody? So Sanjeev is asking towards stops an institute to what well, that to uh, have an incentive for case writing. So I'll give you a point. My institute does have an incentive, a lower level incentive for case writing, not as high as as a research paper, but definitely there is an incentive. You can write and you can write uh, as many as you want. Okay. So uh, I will ask uh, then, uh, and there are no other questions coming in. Uh, Professor Franco is uh, May I ask, I request you to please present your point of view, please. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy to, uh, to be with you uh, uh, today. Um, I, I did not have time to uh, prepare as I was informed a bit at the, uh, I mean, very recently. And, uh, and also my apologies because I, I could dedicate only 30 minutes. So we we'll really need to, uh, to leave in about uh, seven to eight minutes. But if some people have questions, I guess you can uh, pass my information. Uh, on my side, again, viewed from other parts of the, the world, I, I work in, uh, in Southeast Asia, in the Middle East, in uh, Europe, in Australia, etc. Um, the, 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 there are two questions in your question, so I'm not sure which one is the most important to you. Um, there is the quality, I mean, it's the topic of discussion, uh, quality in case study writing and quality in case study teaching. Uh, both, in my opinion, are, are not really an issue if the, the mapping is done correctly. What I mean by that is that uh, very simply, uh, if you are able to state uh, clear learning outcomes for the case study uh, when you write it and, and when you design the, the, the teaching note and ways to measure, uh, of course, with the case study, you won't do an exam at the end, but still ways to, to measure uh, the achievement of the learning outcome, then you have a, it means that there is a certain level of quality in the sense that uh, uh, your case study, what you have written, is indeed uh, helping the learner to reach the learning outcomes associated to the case and, and I guess, associated to the, the module or the course or the, the, the program in which the case is taught. So in that sense, I think that writing a case study uh, is, is not just a fun exercise, but is a very useful exercise. On how it is taken into account, we can have different views. Uh, one, of course, as you know, if you go for any accreditation, uh, be it uh, EFMD accreditation or ACSB accreditation, 
uh, case studies will be rewarded as uh, intellectual contributions. So even if they are not uh, uh, by your uh, uh, own regulators, when you go for international accreditations, they are recognized, so which is some form of uh, uh, incentive for the, the faculty uh, uh, to go for case studies. Then there is another point. Uh, a case study is an intellectual contribution, okay? But I'm not sure it's a research contribution. I think a case study is a teaching contribution. Of course, we could argue that if you do a lot of qualitative research, uh, you could use many case studies to then uh, infer a new model of whatever based on the 10, 15, 20 case studies or three or four, whatever that you have done. But if we are talking about case studies as they are now, and I think from what I understood from the discussion, uh, case studies for learners, this is a teaching activity. So it's not in research that it should be rewarded. It's part of the teaching load or teaching KPI of the faculty that it should be rewarded, even though uh, they, they qualify, they all qualify as uh, intellectual uh, contributions, uh, like as a, a research article would do. And then again, in a very simple. Uh, Professor Theron, yes, may I? Yes. Because when we write the teaching note, yes, you're correct, it is a teaching uh, tool, mm -hmm. but not a research one, I would may disagree. Because when you write the teaching note, you are required to do research in terms of the context, the theoretical paradigm that you have want the students to learn, and the dilemmas that they have, which is the pros and the cons. And you would need a theoretical research base for that, where you have to connect to readings or latest things which the uh, or a framework or a conceptual theoretical paradigm that has to be coming because it's true that your case that you're teaching that as well so there is not such rigorous research but definitely relevant research and some amount of research is there uh, what what i mean by that is that the 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 aim of a research contribution is to uh, advance the the knowledge in a field okay yes. you yes. want to add your own little uh, stone uh, to the body of knowledge yes the point the primary goal of a case study is not that the primary goal of the case study is to give another way to a learner to achieve a certain learning so yes. that you may have a level of learning or type of learning or whatever it is so that you may have to use uh, concepts, models, tools, uh, theories, etc., to build it, yes, and, 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 and in the teaching note, yes. But what I mean is that it's not a case study alone by itself as, the, as, as a finality to support the learner, not to support the advancement of research. Correct. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Perrin, for your... Uh point of view and your wisdom in saying that yeah it is a teaching tool yet and you do require quality research and some kind of you know pedagogical tool has to be coming for the maintaining the quality of the cases that we bring to the class any quick questions uh, the audience has for professor theron or for professor Whippen, you can write it in the chat because one of them has said that yes uh, you know we don't, uh, I, I think the earlier one is it's difficult to get insights from corporate failures. That we agree. I think, uh, you know, for cases, they're usually the, uh, the ones which are benchmark success stories that come out as cases. Very yeah. Sure. You, you, you can use, uh, now you can see more and more uh, case studies of, of uh, uh, failure. Of course, mostly if there is a, a, a happy end, uh, but of related to resilience or managing change or etc. Uh, don't don't hesitate to to write a case on on uh, on a failure because uh, in entrepreneurship uh, failure is one of the sources of success. Yes. So uh, Dr. Sami Khan has said that it's not a methodology. So sir, we were talking of case as a teaching pedagogy and case study by Yin is a research methodology. So there are two different things that we are doing it. Mm -hmm. And how teaching note is based on research, we feel it's a flow of solving the case by the author. 
uh well i would respond to this and sir you would like to respond to this but the teaching note is based on research at least my teaching notes are based on very rigorous research where the conceptual framework has to be justified by the case facts if it's not then it's it's no point doing it then so yeah. uh, professor frankus or professor wisbepin you would not like to uh, uh respond to this question uh, i guess it depends but i i agree with you in the sense that for example uh, I don't know if if you do a, a case study, uh, let's say on the blue ocean strategy. Okay, uh, then obviously you you want this case study to be uh, our case study on core competencies, let's say, which is a stronger concept. Uh, you want the case study to be aligned with the the prerequisites and the the, the tenets of the core competencies theory. And 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 you want it to be also so that students can understand them. So when you deal with very strong concepts, so I guess maybe more core competencies than blue ocean. But when we you deal with concepts which which, which have a, again a strong theoretical background, I think it's important to frame them, particularly because this is also what gives the students the possibility of criticizing the concept. And 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 not only you know spoon fed by oh, okay you just apply uh, you have problem A you apply recipe A you got problem B you apply recipe B no it doesn't work like this in real life and if you want the students to be able to go beyond the case study I think that the the on the contrary giving them relating that to a conceptual framework of course it's applied it's not about research but but relating that putting that into a conceptual framework is very important yes correct sir plus critical thinking critical and innovative thinking for getting a solution so sometimes the students have to also do research to find out maybe which is of course nothing is right or wrong if we follow the harvard way but to even to debate in class or even to you know take on a justification for yourself in case class and to get a highest quality of assurance there you need to do research as a student as a scholar as a faculty you have to do research you just can not walk into class like that or a case class dr vipin would you like to say something yes sir so uh, in a case study uh, what's important is to understand that case study case authorship uh, does not end with whatever case is uh, presented in the class uh, the student must be made a protagonist and be part of the case and if the faculty cannot own the case and extend that uh, to include uh, and make it live case in the classroom uh, then the case teaching quality has not been implemented because quality means uh, something which can be reproduced by the students and if uh, it's a th- it's a, so so that's why research is important that uh, you present the issue that there are different ways of looking at the issue you present competing theories because only one theoretical model then it's not research because uh, research means that you have a theoretical model you came up with something else so there has to be competing theory model uh, that you present in your teaching note there has to be competing causations there has to be competing effects of those causations there has to be competing consequences of those causations and a competing analysis of uh, what happens and uh, so that uh, an appropriate kind of uh, uh, concept can be developed by the students of way of life Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Vipin. Yes, competing models, critical thinking, innovative style, and also problem solving using maybe any concept of design thinking, etc. Where you have to go in depth and see, okay, which is it? Where I, uh, you know, collaborate with my people, where I team up, but I also question, I also brainstorm. so i have to agree to disagree as well so it teaches you a lot of life skills as well to be you know for the quality of uh, teaching to be of that high quality thank you so much i am getting an indication of ending this conversation we were getting in thank you professor vipin and thank you professor theron for being in here for this particular thank session thank you very much thank you. thank you aima for organizing this uh, interesting discussion uh, you, over to you to the uh, to uh, anuja pandey please thank you Many thanks, uh, Dr. Batnagar, for wonderfully moderating the session. Our sincere thanks to Dr. Gupta and Professor Tharin for joining and sharing your global knowledge on case teaching. Many thanks to the panel. Thank you. Now Last we move time. on, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, now we mo- move on to the next session, which is about case writing. 
live interaction with the author of some of the world's most contemporary cases. I'm so happy and delighted to welcome the session speaker, Dr. Amitava Chattopadhyay, the GlaxoSmithKline Chair Professor of Corporate Innovation, Professor of Marketing and Marketing Area Chair in Seattle, Singapore. I also welcome Dr. Anuja Pandey, Head IMA RCRC to moderate the session, please. Over to you, Anuja. Thank you, Soumya, and uh, welcome uh, uh, Dr. Amitabh uh, to this session. I am really delighted to have you with us uh, today evening and uh, to do uh, a little background of what we are doing today. Uh, we are, uh, as you know, we have set up our India Case Research Center, and in the center, we are doing a lot of training programs along with the competitions and case site, uh, which are related to case uh, writing and other things. And today we have been joined by very uh, young uh, budding uh, researchers who have written cases for this competition. And uh, we had uh, been from afternoon, we have been having some panel discussions around uh, the cases. And now we are more focusing today on uh, at this point in time onto the case writing aspect, because a lot of these youngsters who have moved on to the case writing and maybe the senior faculty who have taken up the case writing recently are now looking for greater inputs. And I think there could be no better person than you to really share the insights. And I think while reading up your cases, these all cases have been into very, very diverse geographies. They have been into very diverse topics. And I mean, it looks very simple to say, you have touched upon a, a marketing issue, but it is generally a multi-dimensional issue. So, uh, sir, with that, I would like to open up my very, very first question for the day. I mean, um, you write um, uh, cases which are generally multidimensional, but as a case, young case author, when you're starting up writing and we look into writing cases, how should the case reveal the multifaceted um, uh, phases of a problem? And at the same time, how should we really make sure that we stick to our core, the central idea about the course, uh, the, the case is not uh, being uh, diluted. How do we really handle that? Sir? So, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to the session. Um, I think for me, my case writing has been connected to either my teaching or my research interest. So, uh, I disagree a little bit with the last part of the previous panel because I think cases can lead to research. The case itself is not a research contribution, but cases can be uh, used uh, for doing research. And uh, I have a paper under second round review at the Journal of Marketing based on a case I wrote a couple of years ago. So, um, but I'll come to that later. Uh, writing a case to me is really, you know, developing material that fits with whatever course you're trying to teach. Uh, and so, for example, I started by writing cases on brand management, which is a course that I, that I teach. And then uh, my interests gravitated to emerging market companies. So I wrote a bunch of cases on those, and those were really strategy cases. And then more recently, I've been writing cases on... Um, on uh, two things. One is uh, digitalization because uh, students want to know about what's going on and the best, uh, you know, and, and the other thing is that I'm, I'm interested in how companies can uh, work with the poor, either as customers or suppliers in, in some shape or form uh, to lift them out of poverty. So sort of my cases fall into those three buckets and obviously some of them overlap because uh, there are connections uh, between them. So I think, um, so my first point is, you know, what are you, what are you trying to teach that you, would, you don't have material for that you would um, like to write about uh, uh, to have something to teach? And also for you to understand it, because um, you know, if I if I say, well, digital strategy, I mean, there are so many angles to digital strategy, and really, without you know, if you just read a book or two or ten 
I don't think it would be very easy to teach a case on digital digital marketing. And so I think uh, by doing cases, you learn about them. So one of the first cases I ever wrote was on uh, Tata T's acquisition of Tetley. And, and I wrote it because one of the key points I wanted to make in the course is that brands have value. So if I remember correctly, and it's now 22 years ago, uh, Tata has paid 273 million pounds sterling for Tetley. But the physical assets of Tetley at that time were worth only 55 million dollars uh, pounds. So uh, whatever, 220 or some something million dollars were paid for something intangible. And really what did Tetley have that was intangible? They, they basically had a brand, right? People recognized the Tetley brand and they, they, they bought Tetley compared to others because, and, and, and so how did, and so in the process of acquisition, there, there would have had to be a negotiation to arrive at what is the brand worth. So, uh, and both sides, Tetley and the Tatas would have had to agree on it. And that requires making certain sets of assumptions and doing certain types of calculations. And so I was after getting the data that would allow students to actually, uh, so the case comes with a spreadsheet where students can tinker with the assumptions and see how, what the valuation uh, might be. And so uh, it was driven. And, and I think that, you know, to write a really good case, it can't, it's difficult to do that. Maybe some people can, but I can't do it without primary data. So not only is it that you, you need to find an interesting example, but then you need to uh, get the cooperation of the company. And, and that's often uh, a challenging aspect because companies don't want to necessarily want to reveal things. <clears throat> and so, uh, you know, one of the advantages that INSEAD provides is that because we do a lot of executive education, we actually teach participants from these companies and they're pretty senior senior in the hierarchy. And so you can call up somebody and say, hey, you know, I want to do X <clears throat> and can you provide access to the company? And, and so that's a crucial part uh, in case writing. And then I think in terms of the facets, I mean, you know, we may be teaching brand management or whatever it is, you know, operations management doesn't really matter, but it's really a business problem. And it, it's, it's, it's a problem embedded within a business and it's, it's causing pain for the success of the business. And so you really have to look at it from a business point of view. I, if I look at brand management, I can't just look at it and say, oh, it's, it's all about, uh, you know, which promotion I should run or which advertising campaign I should run. Because at the end of the day, it's about a, a entity that sits within a larger organization. And so you have to connect it to, uh, to, those, to those elements. And, and so, particularly in terms of the audiences I teach. So for example, our MBAs are people who have on average about six years of work experience and they've worked in companies like McKinsey, Procter & Gamble, Unilever, and then they've come to INSEAD to kind of upskill further. And so you can't really go and you know, tell them the basics. Uh, they've been there, done that. So you really have to, and, and the questions they're interested in because they're looking and saying, okay, I'm 30 years old. That's the average age of our students. And by 40, I want to be a CEO. What do I need to get from where I am to CEO in the next decade? And so really they want a strategic perspective. They don't really want to know how do I do market research or uh, how do I actually figure out the, uh, the intricacies of mo the models of brand positioning, but rather what is brand positioning and why is it important and uh, how does one think about it and how does one cascade it through the organization. So you need to think about what you know, learning goals you have for the students and that'll change depending on where you teach. Right? So if you're teaching undergraduates, well, they've never worked, right? They're 19 years old, 18 years old, they know nothing. So for them, explaining what a brand is, 
and having a case that says that, oh, people actually buy, buy because you have a brand is itself a revelation, right? They may never have thought about it. So I think you have to be very clear as to what the learning message is and then work backwards from that. So if you, particularly if you're a marketing person, then, you know, your customer is the student. I mean, they're not quite customers. They're kind of like, um, they are customers and they're not. When they tell me they're my customers, I say, no, 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 they're work in progress. They're like rolls of aluminum <clears throat> waiting to be processed into wires or whatever it is. And so, uh, so that they don't get too inflated an opinion of themselves. But I think that um, they are your customers. And so what is it that they need to learn? And then you work backwards from that to say, okay, therefore I need this kind of input. And then, you know, what is my case going to be? So I wouldn't write a multifaceted case if I was writing for an undergraduate audience. It has to be a simple case that makes some simple basic points. Thank you, sir. That was wonderful. I mean, I, that is very, very insightful. And uh, uh, the type of cases that uh, we have been seeing uh, in the recent times, uh, generally in marketing, uh, big questions about uh, the brand, the brand acquisitions, what it really comes to our organization. A lot of these things have now been uh, uh, discussed in a classroom. It was, I um, mean, uh, earlier we were talking about very basic things about it. But, uh, so when I'm looking into your cases, these cases have been very, very wide. I mean, you have been uh, writing cases on the bottom of pyramid and the rural uh, health in India, and you have been writing cases which are related to LG and uh, that into another geographies like uh, uh, Xiaomi in China. These are very, very different cases. And uh, when we write up these cases, I mean, how important it is uh, to really understand the culture of the organization. Uh, uh, I mean, though we, this case might be about a marketing case, but uh, a lot of time we feel that a lot of decision-making has gone in because of the culture of organization. So what a decision Tata takes is very, very different from what a unicorn in India would be taking today. And their systems are very different because of the culture. So how do you really bring up those uh, cultural concepts into uh, the case so that we can really educate the student about uh, the decision making from the multiple uh, aspects uh, about of the stakeholders. So, so I agree with you that uh, culture of the cor corporation is very important. Uh, but that said, um, that's not really where my interest is. So I just say that the it's given, and then you know in 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 debriefing why they did X instead of Y. So if you pose a certain question in the case. And then, you know, there's a debate. And at the end of the day, at the end of the class, you say, oh, well, this is what Tata did or Xiaomi did or LG did, doesn't really matter. Uh, and, and, and then you might say, well, you know, one of the reasons they did X is because of their culture. But that's not really my focus or interest. And so I don't really, um, you know, I would never... really get into the organizational organization culture uh, piece because that's neither my area of expertise nor uh, nor my interest if you will so I mean my OB colleagues would be writing about that great sir. So uh, uh, another um, uh, very uh, um, uh, very basic question, and but I think it would be uh, very important for all our authors today, uh, is that um, a lot of time we are teaching cases which are very classic cases. These are cases which are very strongly uh, grounded theories are there, but how do we really uh, make them contemporary and we create the contemporary books around it? Well, so I think the theories have not changed. So I think, you know, if I, if I, I just um, finished a case in January on SK2, the Procter & Gamble uh, skincare brand, and it's about, re, you know, rejuvenating SK2. And it's all about transitioning the brand positioning from, uh, a very functional positioning that you'll have 
uh, you know, your skin will be clear and so on and so forth to something where they're now uh, pitching it as, uh, you know, uh, take charge of your destiny. Uh, uh, and, you know, it's a women, women's brand. They don't sell any men's products. And so basically it goes to the angst that women experience that uh, they're hemmed in by society and they're not allowed to live the life that they want to live. And this is a, uh, the brand is taking the position that, well, we like to uh, stand by you. And, and if I, and, 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 you know, that idea basically of linking it to some deeper value associated with angst isn't new. I mean, Dove in 2004, I think, if I remember correctly, launched the, uh, you know, uh, the, I can't, I can't remember the name of the campaign, but that you know, beauty, sorry, the, the beauty, beauty. Ca- real beauty, right? Thank you. So the real beauty campaign. And so, you know, they celebrated beauty in a very different way. And actually, they're not the first company to have done it. So there's a Brazilian company called Natura on whom I've written a case long before the real beauty campaign. And their position was that beauty is inside you. They're a cosmetics player called Natura, but they say, we help you to express that inner beauty. And it's, and, and their, and their uh, tagline translated from Portuguese is wellness well, okay? And so, 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 you know, and then if I go even further back to 1999, I mean, before that, you know, Johnny Walker used to get sold as, you know, you're some wealthy man who owns a castle or whatever it is, and you're like 70 years old, and you've got a 20 year old woman on your arm. And, ooh, you old guy, if you drink Johnny Walker, you too can get that, right? That was the Johnny Walker appeal. But then, uh, actually, a lady took charge of Johnny Walker globally, and uh, she changed it completely to the Keep Walking campaign. And basically, it was that, you know, the world is changing for men. Uh, women have grown in power, as they should. Uh, and men have to adapt because, you know, they grew up in a world where they didn't do dishes. They didn't do vacuum the house. They, they didn't do anything. They just sat around and said, chai. And, you know, Chai appeared, but there was a generation emerging where the women were saying, nah, it's not going to work. And so there was this whole negotiation that was going on and men felt very threatened. And Johnny Walker linked to that feeling of threat and say, we're with you. We'll help you on that journey to go from being a Neanderthal to, you know, a modern man. So, so I think that, you know, this idea has been present and, but In the SK2 case, the new hooks are that they went completely digital, right? So they they have all, they have a digital platform. They've now created a metaverse. uh, And and so you kind of say, okay, so you have a lot of tools today. So the, 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 the theoretical framing is the same, but you have a lot of tools that didn't exist in 1999 or in 2004, right? And so you know, what can you do? How do you use influencers? Influencers didn't exist back then. So uh, they move, they've moved 80% of their budget to influencers. Uh, how do you decide on who, who to use as an influencer? How do you manage them? Because, you know, an ad agency produces something and then you make sure that the ad is like exactly what the way you like it. But here I am sitting and I write about SK2. How do you, how do you manage me? Right? I mean, that requires a whole different set of uh, capabilities. Um, you know, young women feel very threatened by these people who sit as experts at the beauty counter and tell them, do this, do that, don't do that. So now they've, they've said, okay, we, we really don't need those people. Uh, they've created a scanning device that uh, can scan your face and tell you which product of theirs is best suited. And, and you know, you can completely, avoid, if you want to talk to the woman, she's still there. Uh, but they've also moved uh, the name of the woman from being a beauty advisor to a beauty counselor. And I think that those are very different. 
uh, in terms of of the nomenclature. And so, so you know, they've 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 uh, so they you balancing the traditional and the uh, digital, if you will, or the new stuff uh, in an extremely nice way. And then students say, oh, okay, I can learn from this as to how, but how do I choose which uh, influencer? At the end of the day, you're still looking at cost per thousand. I mean, the cost per thousand is still cost per thousand. So, and that's been there when I did my MBA. Uh, uh, so, so, so the basic stuff remains the same. It's just contextualized to the modern world, which is why, you know, you have to um, write new cases because if, otherwise, you know, I could take the case that I will start and teach it now because, the basic message is still the same, but but the but the levers that I have to deliver on that concept are quite different. So you know, uh, that's how I see it. Thank you so much, sir. I think it is a wonderful discussion, and very few minutes we are able to really uh, get a lot of interesting insights as to how we should be writing cases and the interesting books uh, that you have just uh, given to us. Uh, I'm sure we, uh, my, all our participants have been benefited today. We would have loved to have more sessions, maybe in some coming uh, workshop, we'll re really uh, request you to be part of our workshop and really guide our uh, team of uh, uh, very keen case authors. Uh, thank you for uh, accepting our offer and uh, thank you for delivering such a wonderful session today. And uh, uh, with that, we come to the end of this uh, very interesting discussion. And over to Swamya, I think uh, our next uh, session uh, uh, chair has also joined in. I think I could see Charles, uh, sir, already logged in. So I just uh, uh, would uh, go back to Swamya. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chatterjee. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Anuja Pandey. Uh, we are extremely delighted to hear from Dr. Amitava. Many thanks to you, sir. Welcome. Bye-bye. On behalf of IMA, India Case Research Center, we warmly welcome Dr. Charles Dhanraj, Professor, University of Denver. Professor Dhanraj has taught across the programs, undergraduate, MBA, executive MBA, PhD, and executive PhD across several global universities and organizations. Professor Dhanraj's research focuses on strategy and leadership in a global context. Professor Dhanraj has published in several top journals, including Academy of Management Journal, Academy of Management Review, Harvard Business Review, McKinsey Quarterly, Journal of International Business Studies, Strategic Management Journal. He has also written over 50 teaching cases, several of which have been received international awards. Professor Dhanraj serves on the editorial board of several major academic journals. He has served as a deputy editor at Cross-Cultural Strategic Management and a guest editor at Leadership Quarterly and Management International Reviews. With this brief introduction of Professor Dhanraj, we warmly welcome you, sir, and request you to deliver your address on writing world-class cases. Over to you, sir. Thank, thank you so much. Can you hear me clear? Yes, very clear, sir. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. It's, it's, uh, I'm in California this morning, and it's just about 6.15 in the morning. So bear with me if I'm dozing off. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's, it's a fantastic. I mean, I, can, uh, I don't know how to say no to Dr. Raj. So it's, it's very difficult when he asks uh, to say no. And... Uh, and you, uh, Dr. Raj and Anuja, you're doing wonderful things, building the capability of the faculty. And when we do that, it, it, we are building a generation of students who not only understand concepts, but they can apply those concepts in the context in which they are living. And, uh, that, it, and that's what truly what this case teaching is all about, helping students to apply the concept and, and become, uh, to some extent, we make them lifelong learners because once they learn how to apply uh, principles to the cases in classes, they're able to remember those, uh, those concepts 
that they can apply and build their learning all along their life. So to me, life is a case every day and you are learning uh, uh, every day. And that's what we are preparing them for, to become lifelong learners. So for today, I wanted to take uh, one particular aspect. In fact, um, what if what if we have, in fact, we are now doing virtual learning and I can see uh, you are able to do so much with this technology. So maybe I wanted that uh, maybe this is one topic that is always in the mind of us, like how do we bring this power of case learning to the virtual world? Would that be a reasonable way to think through the next 20 minutes? Fine, yeah. Yeah, fine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. So um, let me uh, see if I can share my screen. Just wanted to. Is this okay? Yeah, it's perfect. I'd love to have more sessions. Okay, so the fundamental problem is, in fact, I think we all can recommend. You have done a lot of sessions on the case teaching and stuff. So I just wanted to touch on one of the what I call the most pain, painful things in in today's uh, classroom because we are moving into uh, into zooms and i don't see the that we are going to return to normalcy anytime in the sense even when things become normal the technology is going to be a, a big play for us so how are we going to leverage technology for uh, betterment of education right and Particularly, there are three things I wanted to touch on. The triple E, I call it the experience. How do you bring the energy and how do you bring the engagement, right? And that's a fundamentally the problem, right? And the fundamental thesis I'm taking is uh, sometimes we think technology is like uh, putting a rocket on the butterfly, right? Technology in itself does not enhance the learning. Technology is a mediator. Technology is an enhancer. It is you and I who, as educators, who are able to uh, to bring that. I mean, use the use the technology to to advance the ways students think. Right. The fundamental principle we take is whether we whether we are doing it online or whether we are doing it uh, in person. Learning is a social process, and the student has to be at the driver's seat in order to learn effectively. Right? So think about it, that learning is a social process. It's not about me putting a video and, and, uh, or uh, running the case. I mean, we just talked about uh, the, the whole process of uh, the, uh, the case that Ativa was talking about. And think about it, what is, how does one remember some of the, the, uh, the uh, concepts or the principles of the case, right? I mean, if you think about Johnny Walker case that you teach, at the end of the day, we are not building our students to understand Johnny Walker. Our goal is to get them to understand certain fundamental principles of marketing, right? If that's the case, how do we make sure that it, it comes through? And, and that is, unless the student in, internalizes some of the learning that happens in that Johnny Walker context, and then is able to think about his own application, we have not done the process, right? That they are able to solve the Johnny Walker case is not the, the ultimate goal. Our ultimate goal is in order, in the process of solving the Johnny Walker case, they are able to understand, apply, and internalize a principle. And for that, they have to engage. So it is, uh, it is the social process that embeds that knowledge deep in them, in the, deep in them, right? And the other one you have to think about is, the uh, the principles that we teach, right? It's always about how do we embed a knowledge in an experience, right? How do we, you, in them, you just think about how do we remember certain things, right? People will forget the principle or the particular uh, the concepts that you taught, but people will never forget, forget how they felt, right? So knowledge embedded in an experience has a better shelf life. I don't know if this is uh, the, uh, 
the pine cones that I see every any time when you walk in the uh, in the uh, in the woods, you see this pine cone, and then <clears throat> pine cone has the seed inside, and it is so well preserved all around. And it is this cone that gives the shelf life to the pine seed, right? So think about it, like knowledge embedded in experience is a better shelf life. And the whole idea for us as educators is how do we teach something so that it will endure? It's not about them remembering it for the semester exam. It's about helping them to think about it long for their life, right? So those are the, the challenges that we have and then how to work, work. And the third principle I want you to think about, I mean, we all have been in a concert hall, the music hall. In fact, uh, I just saw uh, one of the sitar uh, play by uh, two of the, uh, the Italian folks playing the Come Some Chapter song. And it, it's one thing, I mean, we all have been in, in an orchestra. Once you are in the orchestra, the, the feeling that you get, right? It's phenomenal, it's phenomenal, right? And then the same music, you can put it in a CD and have it in your, listen it, listen to that music in your, uh, in your uh, bedroom or in your uh, living room. And you can have the best high fidelity instrument, uh, music system. You don't have the same feeling, right? So how do we transfer the concert hall experience in our, in our, in our, in our virtual learning, right? In a, if you think about it, like, uh, most of us have done this. We we walk around, we jump around. In fact, we are the uh, we typically in a clay case classroom. We convert the case classroom into uh, into a theatrics, right? <clears throat> we are running around and we are uh, teaching. And and how do we bring that in this room, right? Right now, I'm sitting down and then work through now. I can do some simple exercise that I normally do in a classroom. Like, for example, I would say, hey, let's all stand up and do something. In fact, I just had a phenomenal experience. I'm just visiting my daughter and she has a two-year-old son. And he is being given some speech therapy by a, by on virtual side. And I'm just sitting on the side watching this two-year-old almost getting alive on a screen, right? Yeah, normally he doesn't speak much, but he's like shouting, engaging and all that. And then I see her screen, that her screen backdrop is full of Muppets and stuff. So she's able to recreate the theatrics and the drama in the, from, the, <clears throat> from the stage she's in. And she's able to bring it to, the, to, the, to, the, to this two-year-old kid. And he or she, the, the, he almost feels like he's in the stage and talking and stuff. So to me, that was an aha moment. How do we bring this to our students, right? If they are in the class, in, the, in, the, in their own room, and then maybe sometime we encourage them to keep the video on. And some, many times it's very hard to keep them the video on. But beyond that, what can we do? So those are some questions that I wanted to think through, right? And the first part I wanted to think about is content versus emotion and the role of the context, right? We just walked about, in fact, I'm glad I'm, I was there for a two hour session. Now, when we think about it, running a Johnny Walker case, or you're running a Walmart case, or you're running a, a Reliance case, right? Now, how do we bring the context to the students, right? If they don't understand the context, we don't get it. And, and this is fine. In fact, if you remember, I was talking about how much difference it makes going from an undergraduate to a graduate to a senior executive, right? You can teach the similar concepts for different audience. And how do we recreate the context? For example, if you are creating the context for your undergraduate students, let's assume that we are doing, I'm, I'm just taking the example that Atawa left, something about retailing experience or something about stuff. Now for these 20-year-old uh, who have not had any real experience, what could we do, right? I mean, to, to get them to think about uh, uh, a company like Johnny Walker or Walmart, maybe too much, too hard for them. So, but then it may be easier for them. For example, if you're teaching a case on Reliance or any other company, just throw them into the field and ask them to go and have a visit to that company and then bring them back into the classroom 
and got, get them to observe, and then you ask them to, to work through it. And we can do that very easily in our virtual learning. Like to some extent, if it is a particular <coughs> company case that you're dealing with, is there an experience that you can create for them that they can go and, and see, come back and work with you, right? And, and to, to some extent, it is the, <coughs> the principle is, unless they are engaged, they are not learning, right? The fact that they are online and, and you are watching my, me, my face and you are watching the slides, that doesn't mean that you are learning, right? Unless you are engaged with the audience, we are not going to learn, right? So what could be some principles that you are In fact, I don't know, I know just, is it possible to have one or two people talk about how they, what issues they, they, they have in getting the class engaged? Anuja? Or, yeah, uh, think, Raj, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. So there are, yeah. there is uh, questions. It's, it's students are raw material. We need to make them finish productive. Uh, industry and society are our customers. So in that particular respect, uh, how we can relate uh, this uh, particular aspect of experience with them? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. And, and then to some extent, like, see, this is where, like, where you, uh, there are two, two, two decisions you make. One is you are deciding to teach the case, but the, the first decision you make is picking the case, right? What is the case that best brings the idea to the classroom, right? Quite often, when we pick a case, we, we pick about how I, do I know about the case? Can I teach it well? Or do I have enough information? Like the most of our decision criteria is on, do I know it? It's important, but can you add the criteria? Can my students understand? For example, uh, I'm going to teach a class uh, two days from now about a, a company called Emphasis, which you all know, but to some extent, my students would not know sitting here in Denver. So how do I make sure that they have some, the backdrop of it? So what do I would do, get an idea about, okay, if you're not understood outsourcing, if you're not in the IT industry, you wouldn't understand outsourcing. So here is an exercise for you to think about it and then get them to come back with, with a question, right? So to some extent, how do you seed questions in, in the exercise so that they can have they can they can engage uh, reasonably well. Otherwise, they're going to take a, even in our case writing, it might become like they are sort of taking it as a textbook and then trying to come back with the textbook concepts. Right. So to some extent, how do we make it easier for them to engage? So opening up for uh, a simple exercise. Maybe you start the question with a with a with, you start the whole case with a. A 10, uh, 10 simple yes or no questions. And then you just give them some time to, to answer the yes or no questions. And then you sort of, by the time they answer, the, the beauty of the virtual learning is, you know how each one has answered. So pick some of the outliers and ask them to, to sort of say, why did you say that? Why did you pick a no versus an S? And then pick two students at the extreme and then put them to conversation to to uh, to talk to each other right so and and that's the way that that i would say i would i would push for engagement yeah right yeah yeah any other any other question from uh, participant side uh, dr anuja somia uh, so this is one question which has come up to my whatsapp group uh, this is a question which uh, I think the panelists have not. Uh, the uh, the question talks about that a lot of time we might have written cases uh, which would have been revealing about a certain organization, certain concept. Once we do uh, the case testing, we realize that this is something uh, which is where I need to really go back to the organization and really do a more in depth research. Uh, a lot of the points which the, were raised in a classroom were not covered. So how do we really uh, make sure that this type of uh, challenge we do not really face uh, when we, we are prepared for a very, very good case before presenting into the classroom? Yeah, uh, see, you have to remember like uh, to a large extent, you are a case teacher, but you are also a learner, right? You never stop learning, right? So every time I teach a case, you come out and then, wow, I can learn, right? 
let me give a very practical example. I wrote a case on Eli Lilly in India with Randakshi, the joint venture, right? And the case was written. In fact, when I started writing the case, that was 2002. And you sit down and uh, you, you uh, in fact, my reason why I started that case was I wanted to showcase how a successful joint venture works. And then as, after I started writing the case and, and started interviewing people, I realized they were just on the last year of their joint venture. They were working through the divorce, right? So they're working through the disengagement process, right? So basically the case, when it finally came out, it was not a case about how to work through. It was a case about how to disengage in a joint venture or how to think about the dynamics of a joint venture, right? And I, I wrote it in 2004 and in, in about 2011, there were multiple joint venture managers that have gone and, and, and gone through. In fact, uh, I used to teach it as a joint venture strategy. And then I realized, as in the classroom, there were, where the students were looking at three different joint venture managers in the case, they basically talked about the role of the joint venture leader. It became a, from a strategy case to a leadership case, right? So to some extent, when you are putting, putting together the, the, the facts of the case, what you, you might have an intention to teach a particular topic through that case. But as the case lends itself to a, to a bigger and a richer topic, you have the choice to go along with that and build it up. And, and this is where your relationship with the, with the organization becomes important. Like today, even today, when after about 25 years of writing that case, I still have a very strong connection to the, to the Lilly, to the India group. And it's, it's a sort of building a relationship. To me, like when you write a case, you are, you are basically building a friendship a relationship, and that endures over time, right? You bring the, some of the speakers to the classroom, they talk about it, and then uh, and everything that you do cements the relationship that you have, right? So you think about it, you as a case writer, you own that relationship, and you nurture that relationship, and it pays back way beyond the just that one case that you wrote. Thank you so much, sir. I think, Soumya, we have got two more basic questions there. Would you like to take them? Sure. All right. Uh, so there is a question which actually the point that sir was in any case elaborating upon. Uh, how do we engage uh, students uh, in a virtual scenario, uh, especially when even their cameras are not on? So any suggestions on any tips or tricks of engagement, sir? Yeah. Um... Now, can you, if you are on the Zoom, I want you to go into gallery screen. Okay, gallery view. And. Yes, sir. And what I would like you to do is uh, take a sheet of paper. I don't know if you have paper near, next to you. Uh, this is an exercise I want all the audience. Okay. Uh, take a simple sheet of paper, right? And I want you to, um, okay, just a paper. And, and I want you to think about uh, a number, okay? I'm thinking about a number between zero and nine. It's a single digit number, okay? And I want you to write down that number. I, I'm writing it down on my sheet of paper. I want you to write it down on your sheet of paper, okay? Now, if you are using virtual... Uh, I have to remove the virtual screen because otherwise you won't see my, my page. So I'm going to remove the virtual screen. And I'm going to show you the number. Okay, are you ready? I want you to just keep, show, keep your camera on and and I want you to, uh, when you're ready, it's right now playing, I'm going to show the number. So I want you to show the number that you have written. 
Okay. Uh, on the count of, uh, let's see, uh, on the count of three. Okay. One, two, three. Can you show the number you have written? Anyone, anyone on eight? Anyone has eight? Seven. Seven. Okay. Okay. You see now, now what what I have really asked you now, now this is see this is the one that yeah, yes, Doctor Ratnakar, right? Ratnakar Mr. Ritten. It's eight. Yeah. Okay. Now this is this is a classroom that you can see. This is this is where engagement comes about, right? I mean, my goal was not to get you to guess my number. My goal was to get your camera on and, and sort of uh, by putting this. Now, this is a very simple one you can try with your students, right? Now, a lot of our professional conferences, we basically sign in and then we just uh, <laughs> move on with other things, right? So, and, and the same thing happens with students, right? So if you really want to know whether they are with you or engaged, these are some small things you can do. You can sort of ask them, okay, hey, uh, uh, if they are coming, coming from, their, from their room, Show and tell. Okay, let we're going to have a next three minutes. I want you to go pick up one small thing in your in your in your in your uh, dorm or in your room, and I want you to come and talk about that particular thing. Okay, show and tell, right? So basically, you want to give them the comfort of putting that camera on. If that you can do it without saying switch on the camera, otherwise I'm going to detect five points. That doesn't work, right? So if you, if you can just give them something to talk about. Maybe hey, my favorite is my this uh, airport box, and I let me talk about it for the next two, twenty seconds. So just pick one and then put them, uh, get them to think about it. So they, then they get through the camera, right? So the camera is all about are they comfortable being a part of the class, right? And and that's where the the, the real challenge for us is getting them to be comfortable with the real part of the class, and that's what the engagement is all about, okay? Just a simple exercise that I wanted to see. Let me go through two more slides and then uh, we'll come back to some of the next question, right? And think about this is where I wanted to see it. Bystander effect. Now, huge thing that you have to remember. Now, what, what was the, the research in bystander effect? It's a whole stream of work in psychology, right? Now, the, the experiment goes like this. They basically, uh, uh, this is a person who is acting he has, he has been stabbed and he's thrown on the, on the pathway, right? And then they say, what happens to the by, uh, people who are walking by? What happens, right? So you, you, you put a man with stabbed wound and bleeding. And then they say that uh, if there is no, the first person who comes in, he sees that and then touches and then tries to act on it. In a sense, if there is no one around and there is only the suffering person, people will stop. And then what they do, uh, they said that the second the second part of the experiment is they put this uh, man stabbed person on the floor on the pathway, and then they have a a standing man idle next standing next to this person, right? One person standing next idly, right? And they find that number of people who stop by, Rimal, just basically becomes half of that. If if three people stop, I mean four people stopped in the first instant. The moment one idle person is there, the number of people who stop to see what happens or do something about it becomes half of it, right? And they put two, two idle persons, the people, in fact, slowly as you increase the number of people on the bystanders, people stop seeing what's happening, right? So you think about it and apply it in the classroom, right? The moment one person uh, is, is not acting, uh, this moment you get this, this is what I call the increasing returns, right? So well, quite often people feel like, okay, somebody can talk about it. Why should I? In fact, think about it. Like so just now what we did, the exercise that we did, the camera, quite a few like, well, somebody will show the number. Why should I? Right? So in essence, when we see this large classroom, there are lots of people who can do, then we, we get to the notion of if somebody can do it, Anybody can do it, so why should I do it, right? So how do you take basically the, the challenge for us is how do we make it that everyone in the in the classroom matter, Ganesh or Shivakami or, or Shilpi, like how do we make sure that even if I'm talking to this 500 
class audience that each one can feel it as it's coming to me. If, they, if, that, if that effect doesn't come, then we don't have the engagement. Okay, another question, Samia. Uh, I can see a lot of comments here rather than questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, one uh, goes what in case to... method, uh, yeah, uh, what if uh, case method is not embraced by faculty fraternity, would one or two cases in a course serve any purpose? See, this is, this is a cultural issue that you have to deal with, right? One, in fact, there are institutions that Everybody teaches cases, whether it is an accounting class or a finance class or marketing class, or there are institutions where only the strategy professors or marketing professors, they teach cases. And then you have the other extreme end where nobody teaches cases, they are all lectures and PowerPoints. So how do you become, right? So uh, is there anybody, I mean, uh, if you can show me uh, your hands, like, uh, uh, I don't know how you have, like, how many are one that, uh, you know, in my institution, everybody is teaching or, or at least there are enough people teaching cases. Just if you can show me a thumbs up. Now you can see there is uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? It's not that, that, that many institutions you will find everybody is teaching cases, right? So when you are an outlier, when you are the only one, when you are the minority, the challenge for you is just, can, can somebody give me an idea when you are the only one wanting to teach cases, what problem do you face? Just pick, pick, pick any, anyone, anyone who can talk about it. Like I am the only one, I think I am the only one or myself and my two more colleagues, only the three of us are interested in cases, but many of the institution is not. What sort of problem do you face? When you are the minority, What's other problem? Dr. Radha? Yeah, Dr. Radha. Anuja, would you like to add? Because participants... Dr. Radha uh, Sharma wants to say something. Uh, Sir, participants are not e enabled with the mic uh, as of now oh. in this arrangement. So they can chat. I, Otherwise, Dr. I, Anuja can probably add something here. I think we can give right to Dr. Radha Sharma. She um, uh, can be given right. I think IT can help us out with that. Otherwise, his question was... What was the question? In finance or accounting case, generally, students expect specific answers to problem how to deal with this issue. Yeah, uh, that, that's a very good question. In fact, uh, uh, a few years back, I brought the whole accounting faculty because one of the... the in fact, I was having a coffee with my professor in accounting and she was the chair of the accounting department. She said, uh, it's nice, Charles, that you are uh, advocating cases. But you know, in accounting, we don't use cases and we cannot use cases, right? And then she basically said, we cannot use cases because there is no room for any error. There is no room for the, we only have two plus two is equal to four. There is no subject, uh, subjective stuff. I said, oh, interesting. And I, I, I basically narrated, I, I, I did my MBA, I'm going to date myself here, 1991 in Wilfrid Laurier in Canada. And I had my first accounting class. I still have not forgotten the case because it was the case about a florist, right? I mean, uh, so the, it was about revenue recognition principle, right? And the, the case was about, here is a florist selling flowers. Every day she sells some numbers and then the, the one small line in the case is every day, at least 10% of the people will come back to return the flowers they got the previous day or the, the day before because they were not up to the expectation, right? So at the end of this, uh, the, the, the challenge for the students was to estimate how much money has she earned for that particular month, right? And it is a problem what in accounting we call revenue recognition, right? And if you know that there is a certain percentage of products that are going to be returned, even though you have charged it as sales, you have to, accounting principle says, you have to, to recognize that you have to make a provision for return, right? So that was a simple principle I learned about 35 years back and I, told, I can't forget it, right? So 
how do we get them? So once we get them, I mean, you think about accounting, uh, a lot of decisions that we make are subject, right? How do I decide whether this is going to be an R&D or research and development expense that is, that is eligible for tax or it is not eligible for tax, right? So finding those issues, in fact, that's why like you have to sort of engage some uh, the, the issues that we, are, we can bring, uh, bring to the table is how do we re re recognize the revenue? How do we allocate the cost? Should it be this term or the next quarter? And how, how, how are we going to make those adjustments, right? So finding, finding problems in accounting that make it interesting for us to do. So, so there are two ways to teach accounting. One is just take some simple, uh, what I call, how let's make sense of the numbers. So you take balance sheet and financial statements and then walk them to get them to walk through and, and ask them, will they, will they decide or not? I mean, that's a typical, what we call it, uh, making sense of the numbers and, and using that for making judgment about strategy. But if you are training accounting class, I think there are many ways we can do it. And we have, we have a lot of people. In fact, my, one of my colleagues in Colombia is a professor of accounting. He basically wrote the whole book on uh, teaching accounting with cases. In fact, uh, the editor of the accounting review, TAR, which is the top journal, she's, a, she's at Stanford and, and she's a phenomenal case teacher. In fact, she wrote a whole, in fact, you can find her uh, uh, YouTube video on teaching accounting with cases, right? So, so the, it's about how do we get, get, to, get to bring people to understand? And there are always experts in your field, in your field to find and then work with them. So no, no field, in fact, every field, in fact, anytime a problem, if it is only two plus two, then you and I are not needed. We don't need what I call thoughtful judge, judgment making people in the managerial seat. The moment we think about managers, executives, and leaders, there is so much of judgment we are making and that's what case teaching is all about. So how do we find the right people, number one, and then how do we bring some of those experiences and then socialize it with our field, right? So how, for example, auditing, or I mean, to me, like I've seen it, uh, I'm a, I mean, I'm a very much converted person. So to me, you give me any field, I can tell you how to, how to use cases to, to build it up. And it is finding the right people. And, and if you are one, who is struggling to connect with some some particular expert? Let me know. And Dr. Raj and Anuja, we know fairly a lot, a large number of people, and we can connect you with the right right expert in your field to write that case. Sure, sir. I think uh, uh, we we would have one more session with you, which is typically for these uh, finance and accounting people. So maybe that insight can be shared. And I I like to put on records. Last year, we had one case uh, study, which was basically uh, about the IOCL case. And in fact, uh, this case study was submitted by one of the author in the case. Uh, this was about the uh, IOCL hedging strategies amidst the volatile Indian rupee. And uh, the same case we later used in a case competition with SRCC students. And it was a wonderful discussion that really emerged out of it. I mean, it was more, one of the most wholesome discussions which we could expect from our undergraduate college students. So uh, I think uh, there is a lot of uh, things which we can do with the cases, even in the accounting and uh, finance area. Uh, yeah, and definitely. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Anuja. Uh, Dr. Vidya is mentioning about the OBHR where you're saying you're uh, writing often without any supporting document because the organization does not want to talk about it, right? Now, see, OBHR is a field which is fantastic because there you can write a page and a half and a, a very short case, and you can have a wonderful discussion, right? For example, I have a very a simple case in international business, which was an, a, a page and a half, and it's about a uh, young executive uh, and his fiance and, and them have moved to a new place and he, he gets an offer to go to Belgium. And the situation is that his, uh, his fiance is counting on him to settle in this particular place where they are and move on. And what do we do? And the case basically is about a page and a half. It doesn't have a lot of detail about it, but there's some sketchy details about the company and stuff. But particularly the case is about work family issues in international business careers, right? 
Now, the moment you set it up and, and, and it plays very well. In fact, what I do is I create a role play. Uh, in fact, you can do this online. You can do it in person. In fact, uh, in, a, in a role play, like for example, I can now put uh, one versus other. Like I, I can put Dr. Vidya yourself and maybe somebody in the screen and then they talk about it back and forth. So role play can be a phenomenal way to engage and phenomenal way to bring the case to, to life, right? The, the, the important thing is, can does, does this have, see, it's not the case that gets so much attention in the publication process, right? What you and I do, is not so much preparing the context of the case, it's we are basically providing a pedagogical structure, right? We are converting a business situation to a learning moment. We are converting something that happened some time ago into a teachable moment for the students so that they in turn can embed some big principles in their mind, right? So it's not about the case itself. <coughs> what you really need is a good teaching note. Okay, how do I bring this? So in fact, my case is a page and a half. My teaching note is about 40 pages because I give them the role play ideas, the, the principles that you have to do, the four articles that they can talk about in work family related work family related uh, context, right? So the, the the publication process is all about what is the intellectual contribution we make. The innovation you bring to the table is not the business situation. The innovation you bring to the table is the pedagogical structure. How do we create and how do we choreograph that event in the classroom in such a way that students who are put into that context and they're able to make certain judgments and then they're able to reflect and then say, yeah, that's what's the right way to think about it. I wish we could continue the session and could listen to Sir for some more time, but time for us to close. Um, very engaging uh, session, uh, Professor Dhanraj. Uh, you are a guiding light for uh, case writers and case teachers, your thoughts uh, have refreshed us uh, in form of, you know, morning breeze coming straight from California. Thank you so much for joining us and enlightening all of us. So with this, thank we you. close the current session. Uh, thank you, thank Dr. You. Raja Garwal, for your presence too. Thank you. Goodbye thank you. for now. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. <laughs> thank you. Uh, sorry for disturbing you so hard. <laughs> No, no, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much and, and have a wonderful rest of the day. Bye. Bye-bye, sir. Thank you so much. Now I hand over the session to Dr. Anuja Pandey, Head India Case Research Center, and request her to propose the vote of thanks and also share the rules of the competition. Sure. Uh, thank you, Soumya. And I think I'll take a few minutes to really uh, uh, brief the people about the competition. And um, uh, and very quickly, I, I I know that participants who have joined us for the competition are waiting to understand as to how this uh, whole thing would be working uh, uh, work for the, them. And uh, I I just uh, just one second. Let me. I I hope the screen is visible. So it is. yes, yes, yes. It is visible. You can put it on full screen if possible. Right. So uh, everyone who has joined us for the competition today, I, I'm, I'm sure uh, you're lo all looking for as to what are the guidelines. We have shared the guidelines a couple of times during the uh, pre-conference uh, webinars and also into our all communications which are going around. And uh, just very quickly, I'll tell you that uh, at India Case Research Center, we, we are holding up these type of competition primarily with an objective that we want to build up the competencies of uh, Indian faculty into the case teaching and case writing. And uh, with that very objective, we are uh, trying to figure out as to how uh, this whole competition can be of benefit to the larger population. I'm very thankful for all the people who have taken up the call to write, really write cases and teaching notes for us. And as Dr. Dhanraj was pointing out uh, for us, both the teaching note and the uh, the case are equally important and that is why we, we have been promoting up the whole idea uh, that uh, every document which comes to us for this competition has to come within two documents. One is a main case and another is a teaching note. And I, I think all the cases which had the both documents were initially, they got into the screening process and then we went into the initial review. 
and uh, now that uh, you have your case has been selected this is the time where we want to really make sure that uh, we develop high quality cases which are uh, focused on the teaching concept and that is why we we organize this competition so basically our evaluation criteria is uh, rooted both on to the main case body and also on to the teaching mode so uh, while uh, making up your presentations tomorrow i'm sure you uh, the cases that you have submitted have already reached out to the jury members they have an access to all your cases and your teaching mode but tomorrow when you are making up your presentation i would want you to really be very precise because we have given up uh, around 10 minutes for the presentation so be um, be very clear that these 10 minutes you should be utilizing for the uh, right uh, approach to focus as to what are the key takeaways from your case studies please uh, make sure that you do not really talk about too much about the organization or you too much about what was your journey idea here is that what uh, what is your case about so your slide should actually focus on the relevance of the case uh, in the in what context are you teaching this case what is the content of the case is it a marketing case a, um, a hr case what are the issues that you are really going to uh, touch upon into this case that is why where your opening paragraph your um, your abstract becomes very very important and then you need to really focus on as to what is the uh, the usability of this case why should we you be really considering your case as a case which should be taught in your classroom so you need to really uh, defend your case as a very very good document to for teaching learning and that is where your defense is very very important and you need to really make sure that uh, the the abstract that you have talk, uh, you have written uh, uh, maybe this might be a uh, uh, 150 word abstract that is there maybe you can just make sure that you read this abstract in another uh, a minute or so so that you apprise the people what the context of the case we make sure that you really bring out what is the dilemma what what are the key uh, call to action points for the student into the classroom what are the hooks you have created and how uh, who is your protagonist into the case and then uh, we uh, we would be evaluating the written part of the case to the quality of writing and the pattern of writing and how uh, the layers of the cases have been set in that is that is something which our jury would have done uh, before you they really reach out to you or maybe during that same process 40% of the weightage is now been given up to your teaching note and that is why we are, we have we would like to make sure that you emphasize during your presentation that what is the theory linkage the case is not a story this is something which is some way where you are actually bringing out some kind of theoretical concept into the classroom so you you should be addressing into what type of theories are being taught or are intended to be covered through the case you should also really uh, focus on to what is the uh, the teaching pedagogy that you expect the case can be used into i mean do you want the role plays to be there or you want it as a uh, uh, as a discussion case or a group discussion case or an individual case case discussion how do you really want to take it this is something which should uh, which i could see in most of the teaching note but yes you need to emphasize it uh, during your presentation your uh, uh, learning objective should be very very clearly read out and that is why please uh, try to keep a slide on to the learning objective because as i said teaching note is very important for your evaluation perspective and then the additional um, reading reference material which is connected with the theory part of it so we don't want you to elaborate too much on it but yes the, you, your document would have it you should only mention or uh, make a passing reference of it that uh, to make sure that people know uh, the context i mean we are expecting a student to come to the classroom well prepared to really tackle up a case so what is the basic pre reading material and the post reading material that you will really, really want people to really go through and if you have in your case you are using up some kind of videos what are these videos we don't want you to play the video in between the presentation we just want you to really talk about is it a video about the protagonist interview or it is something which was there into the uh, the media which you have tried to really incorporate into the case this uh, bit on on it and then you have to really talk about uh, uh, the significance of the case or the case question which are been mapped with the bloom's uh, taxonomy so this is something which we which i am sure most of you have done it but uh, you should be emphasizing into your presentation part of it because as i say this is this is where you are leading up the people to really uh, understand what you have done with your case and your teaching note 
if you have done a field research you have gone to a, 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 a organization please do mention it because we are primarily looking into what has been your experience as a case author what did you learn and what is this learning that you want to bring back to your classroom so we would uh, we have already shared with you the template of slide uh, you can you uh, follow that pattern but maybe uh, if, uh, it's up to you how do you want to really take it further but yes we would want uh, that your presentation should be very very focused you should be able to complete your complete presentation uh, within the stipulated time you should, uh, and please keep a note of the time yourself so there would be people to help you out because this is a competition and it comes with a, a prize money around it so we we are also being very very careful about that this prize money prize goes to the right authors and prize is also not the only focus of the competition idea and objective was to encourage most of you to write cases and i am very really happy to note that almost 75 people have uh, cases have reached out to us and these are some of them have been co-authored by two or other uh, people so maybe uh, at least we have been able to stimulate 200 plus people to write cases that, for us that's that, that's the biggest takeaway so we were able to encourage people to write cases and uh, this uh, competition comes with a lot of awards and recognition. So apart from the prize cases, we would have something which is, which are, there are five cases which would uh, really get a uh, award for excellence, uh, that is a certificate for excellence. And then there are 10 studies which would make up to the certificate of merit. And every author who has written a case for us would also be getting a part participation certificate. And once the case competition is over, now I want to make a few more announcements before we really um, uh, uh, take a leave today. So during your presentation, you would have a, pan, a, a, jury, a, a set of jury members who will be giving you reviews about your case. So please take a note on what are the suggestions being given there. And uh, these suggestions need to be noted by you so that you can make the correction because our next step after the competition is that we would try to bring out all these cases into our case center take up through the review um, and the publication process and later distribution of these cases to the wide network in IMA enjoys with the B schools. So this is this is the time where you, your first peer review would be done. Please take a note of what are the suggestions being given or what are the general observations there. You can make amendments and correction. After the competition, maybe in another 10 days, we'll be reaching out to you for a revised case. And once we reach, uh, get the revised case, we would then push these cases to our uh, another set of reviewers and also the copy editors who would finally make sure that this case a document is converted to something which is a publicable publication document and we would then publish these cases to India Case Research Center Case Journal and uh, these cases would uh, uh, we will take another round of consent from you uh, before we really, really uh, progressing into that and all these cases would then be published to India Case Research Center and would be consumed by uh, the uh, Indian B schools across, uh, and also the uh, B schools attached with us across the globe. So this is a very very prestigious com uh, competition for us, and I'm sure you would also greatly benefit from this uh, opportunity because IMA comes with a lot of uh, uh, suggestions because you will be getting a lot of suggestions from our reviewers, our publication team, the copy editors. This is a complete learning journey for uh, people and. Uh, uh, of course, the publication would be the best thing we can do for you. So uh, uh, I would uh, like to really uh, take this opportunity to make sure that every one of you understands what is the importance of the competition and rule of the game. Please be very, very fair uh, to yourself and to all your jury members. Do your best. We have already shared the schedule for in, uh, your presentation. And uh, I'm sure all of you have gotten access to it. This is also available on IMA website. We have also created uh, uh, the support team from IMA has been reaching out to you for your presentation. At any point in time, if you are not able to make your presentation because of a network issue or any other issue, just um, drop an email to us. We are uh, my email ID and my colleague Shiny James email ID is there with you. You also have our telephone numbers in uh, uh, there. You can reach out to us and in case maybe somebody is traveling and maybe is not able to show his slides, my team members would help you out with everything there. So uh, please do your best. So good luck to all of you. And I take this opportunity uh, to really put up a, and propose a vote of thanks 
i think this is this has been one of the most wonderful sessions that uh, i have attended um, uh, in uh, uh, from i am case research center uh, where we have uh, been doing lot of webinars but i'm sure the takeaway for this session have been really really great because we uh, we were able to really uh, get some of the most learned people into the case teaching case uh, writing uh, to our audience today i'm sure uh, you would have also learned and you would have been waiting to really make amendments in your cases because of the inputs shared by these people i'm really thankful to all the people who have joined in i mean uh, right from the chairman aicts encouraging word he has been always supporting and i think because of his support we are here today um, and we are very confident that our uh, publication cases would reach out to these schools uh, because of uh, aict support that is there with us we are all we are really very very fortunate to have uh, dr rajendra shrivastav uh, the pioneer into the case uh, concept and uh, pioneer in building up one of the finest institution in india the isb uh, to uh, really open up the session for us uh, i am really thankful to dr uh, uh, ajit balakrishnan for supporting us uh, uh, with uh, with uh, with the case competition and i think without uh, his encouragement we i mean he encouraged uh, us to a larger extent that he wants every indian uh, case uh, indian case author to be publishing with us so that type of encouragement was really great i am really honored and uh, thankful that uh, dr bhimram and uh, vp joined us today though he had a very very busy schedule uh, uh, to the case, the uh, the case center uk and uh, to the uh, asian case research center we are very very fortunate to have them as our partners in this case competition uh, they have been guiding us in lot of activities and i am sure uh, our collaboration with both these uh, institution is going to really grow further and really make sure that indian cases reach out to masses across the globe we are also very very thankful to uh, the efmd and uh, uh, especially uh, uh, nitish jain for helping us out to connect with one of the finest professors uh, from african business school and the dean director who has been mentoring uh, or mentored almost 150 schools across the globe to really take up case methods as their pedagogy and uh, we we uh, really um, look forward that efmd keeps on supporting us in our initiative because this is we are very very primitive we are very um, at a very very nascent stage at this point in time but we want to really grow and become one of the finest center for case development uh, across the globe so with this ambition uh, i am very thankful that we had uh, some of the finest professors from three major iims i am bangalore i am calcutta i am uh, uh, lucknow and i am the ghaziabad professors joining us in this session uh, i think uh, uh, that really speaks about the support uh, we are enjoying from all the iims uh, in our case center i am really thankful to mbi uh, professor dr uh, jyotsna patnagar for being here with us and i am sure uh, we would have her in more sessions where we would have a very detailed discussions and uh, workshops around uh, the case writing uh, because she has been really pioneering the case writing and i'm uh, she just texted me we have got three more cases she has published with harvard business uh, schools that is something which is very very encouraging for a indian case uh, writer and i'm sure we'll benefit from her guidance in our coming uh, competition and our uh, workshops i am really thankful that uh, dr vipin uh, uh, gupta and dr charles dhanraj joined us from uh, overseas and uh, and dr amitav chatopadhyay from india at singapore all these professors had really difficulty in really maintaining the time zones with indian uh, uh, schedule but i am really thankful that they joined us and really contributed a lot i'm sure uh, uh, all the case authors would uh, really be really be waiting to hear more from these uh, learned people we'll have them more, sometime again into our competition so uh, i would also like to uh, bring at this point in time the support that i have from my ima uh, team members i think they are wonderful people and uh, i think the type of uh, 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 support that we get uh, get from them that really uh, i mean we are able to put up a, a conference in uh, less than a month's time getting everything together is is something which is which Uh, happens why because we have a very very supportive team at IIM, and uh, I would try to tell you all that uh, tomorrow we would have the competition. We would have uh, presentation in nine parallel sessions, and after that we would have on twenty sixth 
three thirty, we are starting with our valedictory session, where we have got a very very interesting session, which is around uh, uh, talking about uh, editor's choice, rigor, process of evaluation and handling reviewers' comment. I'm sure after you have presented this uh, uh, case into the competition tomorrow, this session would be something which would be the key takeaway for you um, uh, for your further case development. And we would have Dr. Radha Sharma. She has joined us today also. Uh, we would have. She is the editor for one of the finest journals from India, and uh, which is a A category, ABDC A, A category journal. And we have Dr. Shalini Rahul Tiwari, who is from Emerald Emerging Market Case uh, Case Studies. Uh, she is the associate editor there, and she would be also sharing some of the insights from another business uh, case center that is the European case. Uh, that is a uh, Emerald uh, uh, Emerging Market Case uh, Center journal. And I'm sure her views would be very, very important. And along with that, as promised, we would have uh, Angela uh, Yan from Hong Kong Business School. She would be also sharing some of the very uh, insightful discussion as to how you can publish with how, uh, Hong Kong Business School. What are the things which Hong Kong Business School, Asia Case Research Center, one of the most prestigious case research centers across the world, really uh, takes up uh, to the cases. And uh, Please um, take a note that uh, the, all the announcement for the winners would be done into the validity session. So please join us uh, on uh, 26, 30. Though my colleague uh, would be sending you the mail and my team at IMR tomorrow would be supporting you into all the processes. Anytime you feel that you, have, you, uh, you are a little challenged, please reach out to us. Uh, we have shared the email IDs and phone numbers. We are always there to support you. And best of luck to all the participants for their presentations tomorrow. And with that, we come to end of today's uh, session. Uh, and I'm, uh, I, with that, I would wish you all the best and a good night and a good day from all uh, who have joined us from different geographies and have still the daytime there. So um, thank you all and see you tomorrow, 10 o'clock. Thank you.